We don't have records on that 9/11 was done by Muslims. It is just just a hypothesis. Muslims are being targeted. They call the terrorists. Directly and indirectly, they are the politicians. For the vote bank, for the power, for the money. The thousands of innocent people that have been killed in Afghanistan goes to Iraq. More people are being robbed. More people are being raped. The main purpose is what? Oil. It's an open secret. We have Buddhist terrorists, we have Hindu terrorists, we have Sikh terrorists, we have Jewish terrorists, we have Christian terrorists. Terrorism, Terrorism. is not the monopoly of any religion. Any religion. It is not. Distinguished guests, brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum. May peace be on all of you. Welcome to today's program. I, Dr. Muhammad Naik, am your host for today. We begin today's program with the Karat by Kari Rehan Ghalib. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Man qatala nafsan bi ghayri nafsan sin aw fasadin fil ard aw fasadin fil ard fa ka'annama qatala nas وَمَنْ أَحْيَاهَا فَكَأَنَّمَا أَحْيَا النَّاسَ جَمِيعًا صَدَقَ اللَّهُ الْعَظِيمُ The translation of the verse from the glorious Quran, Surah Al-Maida, chapter 5, verse 32. If anyone kills a human being, unless it be for murder or for spreading corruption in the land, it would be as if he has killed the whole of mankind. And if anyone saved any human being, it would be as if he has saved the whole of mankind. We thank the many Muslim and non-Muslim senior police officers, advocates, and intellectuals who have urged Dr. Zakir Naik to speak on this topic of terrorism and Muslims in a sensible manner. We also thank Justice Hosbeth Suresh to have consented to be our chief guest today. Our chief guest, Justice Hosbeth Suresh, is a former judge of the Bombay High Court, who retired in 1991. A prominent human rights activist, he personifies the right blend of simplicity and righteousness. He regularly writes articles in the law journals as well as leading magazines and newspapers of India. His recent book, Fundamental Rights as Human Rights, is remarkable. He has spoken at many international forums. He is well known for his report on the riots in Mumbai in 1992-93, entitled The People's Verdict. As member of the Citizens' Tribunal on the Gujarat carnage against Muslims, his report, Crime Against Humanity, released in November 2002 in Ahmedabad, is notable and very widely acclaimed. His reports on excesses against Dalits in Mumbai, students in Kerala, Christians in Gujarat, and others, too, are quite notable. An apt chief guest to address our audience today. Brothers and sisters, let's welcome Justice Hosbet Suresh. Friends, I think I should begin with Lord Denning a great judge from England, because he's no more. I'll just say what he said once. 
Judges do not speak as actors do to please. Judges do not speak as advocates do to persuade. Judges do not speak as historians do to relate the past. Judges speak to give judgments. I'm a retired judge, not a tired judge. I give no judgments, but I think I speak. And I believe in speaking. I speak against violation of human rights. I speak against wherever there is injustice, wherever there is violence, I speak against that. And I always expect the judges to come out and speak. If judges cannot speak against violation of human rights, injustice, who else can speak? It is the experience all over the world that every violence by the terrorists has only resulted in more violence by the state. It's a sort of vicious circle, and it can never bring about any lasting solution. In 1984, we had a certain bomb blasts in Delhi and around Delhi. The Khalistanis, it was the Khalistanis uh, movement, Khalistani movement was very, very active at that time. The Khalistanis were terrorists at that time. So what we did, how to control the terrorists, we brought TADA law. TADA, the most draconian law. Uh, TADA has been misused, as you all know. And uh, what all things happened under TADA law? Large number of innocent people were arrested, tortured, kept inside. I remember Justice Ajit Singh Baines, a retired judge of the Punjab High Court, elderly man. And what he did in a public meeting, he was talking of, of the oppression that was going on in Punjab elsewhere. And he said in a public meeting, someday we will be free from this. Now, the Tata law had the provision for disruptive activities. Nobody could have said anything about disruption of this country. Nobody could have spoken about cessation of any part of the country. Nobody could have said Kashmir should get independence or somebody, some other part should be free. Nobody could have spoken about it. And if you say anything of the kind, that would be an offense. So when Justice Ajit Singh Baines only said, one day we'll be free from this, what he meant was free from oppression, free from injustice. What happened to him? He was arrested, handcuffed, a judge of the high court handcuffed paraded in the street and taken before the high court. The high court judges could not give bail. That was the law. Went to Supreme Court. Supreme Court could not give bail. So he had to remain inside for nearly more than a year. What happened at the end of it? There was no case. This is the kind of thing. That was the law. Under Tata law, over 75,000 persons were arrested. They were all kept inside. No bail was given to them. And under the Tata law, the police could extract confessions, torture, variety of ways of torture, violence in torture, all sorts of things, and then extract confessions. And ultimately, what happened at the end of, when the Tata came to an end, sometime in 1995, you'll find, at the end of it, large number of houses, people suffered, all sorts of injustice. But at the end of it, 72,000 per and odd persons were just released, no trial, no case, nothing of the kind, but they suffered injustice for months together, years together inside the jail. And again, what is the conviction rate? Again, one conviction under Tata law was only 1.8%. So yet the Tata law had its effect. It made the police autocrats. The police could do whatever they liked, and none could do anything. The politicians could use Tata law for whatever they wanted, and they could arrest and keep any person behind the bar, and nothing could, could have been done. So in 1995, the law lapsed because there was widespread protest against this law. We all protested. Tata is a draconian law, and we don't want that kind of law. And it has not brought any terrorism down, if you think of terrorism as such. So it came to an end from 1995. Then, of course, came 9-11-2001. And what we did immediately, nothing happened in India. Whatever happened, happened in New York, World Trade Center. Yet, Bush had announced, 
War itself, and immediately he said there will be war against terrorists. And Bush said again said, those who are not with us are against us. And we wanted to show, oh, we are with America. We are with Bush. So what we did, we brought Porta. Again, what happened in Porta? It's a versatile law. And uh, hold all law. You can arrest anyone under Porta. Again, the same thing happened, what happened under Tada law. And large number of people suffered. Then whether, and they were arrested, terrorists or no terrorists, nobody knows what it was. This is a kind of law. Law was brought only to terrorize the people. See, this is relevant because today people do talk of POTA. They want a law like POTA after what happened on 7-Eleven in the trains in Bombay or what happened in Malaga two days ago. They say, without law, harsh law, we cannot control terrorism. And I, I can tell you, harsh law had never been able to control terrorism anywhere in this country or anywhere in the world. Again, when Porta was there, as I tell you, Porta was being debated in the parliament. And what happened was, when the audience was being debated, there was an attack in parliament on 13th of December 2001. Thereafter, when the Porta was passed in Calcutta, there was U.S. information center was bombed. Then came Akshadam Temple, sometime in 24th September 2002. Then came Raghunath Mandir, 24th November 2002. Then we had in Ghatkopar, Mumbai, Mulun, on 2nd of December. And then, of course, Gate of India, Zaveri Bazaar, 25th of August, 2003. So in spite of the law, the water bomb blasts were continuing. And Porta had no effect on whatsoever. In the year 2002, according to a statement made by the Attorney General of India at that time, 4,038 terrorist-related violent incidents took place in Jammu and Kashmir, in spite of the army and other security personnel and the law. The number of terrorists killed on the spot in the year 2002 was 1,707, of which 508 were said to be foreigners. In Kashmir, the total number of people killed during the last about 17 years amounts to about 80,000. Thousands have simply disappeared. And this has happened in Punjab. Punjab also, when Khalistan was movement was there, large number of people were disappeared. Nobody knows what happened to them. Till the other day, some years ago, they found the dead bodies, the skeletons on the side of the river Bias. I remember I'd gone there to conduct an inquiry. And what I noticed there was, I went around, talked to people, I went around, met some, went to some houses. And in most of the houses, the elderly couple were there and the younger children were there. The in-between generation was not there. Nobody knows what happened to them. They were taken to the police station in the midnight, and next day they, they, they would not come back. And after eight days or 10 days, they would be found dead somewhere here or there. This is a kind of law. So question is, violence is a continuous thing, killing and counter-killing. In Kashmir, in Manipur, I went to Manipur, uh, again the same thing. In Chhattisgarh, in Telangana, in many places, killing has been routine. The other day, the Prime Minister suggested we should have counter-terrorist wardens. What does it mean, the counter-terrorist wardens? Who should be counter-terrorist wardens? You and I, we take the role of counter-terrorist wardens. I don't know. The Prime Minister suggested that. What happened in Kashmir? We made an experiment some years ago. We had arrested a large number of Kashmiris. They were all rotting in the jail. They were confined to the jail. And what we did was, our government said, brainwashed them, told them, you go back, and go back and tell the people they should not fight like this. They should be afraid. They should change their attitude towards India. Do that. But they said, if you go, we will be attacked. So the government, what the government did, we'll give them guns. So the people who went back were given guns. And I remember, during one of those elections, our people's uh, PUDR, uh, the Democratic Rights Organization, brought a report. And there was voting at that time which said gunpoint, voting at, with gunpoint. There was an army, gunpoint from the militants, there was a gunpoint from the security force, there was a gunpoint from, uh, from, the, from the military, from the other uh, uh, railway, I mean, other security officials, and there was a gunpoint at least by these people. Would that solve a problem? Violence against violence. Again, uh, 
what we did in Chhattisgarh the other day. Chhattisgarh, there are Maoists are there, Naxalites are there, how to eliminate them. So we have started a brigade of tribals. Over 5,000 tribals were asked to join. And then they called it Salwa Junum. And with the result, what happened was all the tribals were killed, but the Naxalites are still there. This is the kind of thing that we are thinking. So what I'm trying to say is not a single terrorist you see, in this country uh, has been tried or convicted. Nothing is of the kind. What we have done is only killing. In Bombay, for example, bomb blast took place in 93. 93. Conviction, of course, still we don't know. The conviction, the real culprit, where are the real culprits, one doesn't know. Of course, people who have been rotting in jail for 13 years and so on. Tomorrow is supposed to be the D day, the judgment day. Well, I don't know whether the judgment will come or not. This is the kind of thing. And again, you'll find uh, in uh, Akshardham, there was an attack. Again, who are the culprits? They were shot dead. In a parliament attack, who are the culprits? We don't know. We shot them dead. This is the kind of thing that we are doing. So we have only violence as in answer to violence. That is all this kind of thing. Even after 9-11, what did Bush do? He declared a war. War against whom? War against terrorists. War against Osama bin Laden. What did he do? He bombarded Afghanistan. He killed a large number of poor people. No one is sure whether Osama bin Laden was killed or not, but a large number of innocent people died. So also in Iraq, they said, OK, Taliban's are in Iraq. They also said, Iraq has got what you call uh, uh, weapons of mass destruction. No evidence of that. And yet, of course, in fact, the evidence has come there. No Taliban also there in Iraq. And yet, what he did was bombarded war, war against Iraq. Large number of innocent people died. The number of number lost to terrorist atrocities in New York on the World Trade Center coming down is less than a tenth of the toll in Iraq, that kind of killing. If there's anyone who can be called a terrorist, I said this in an earlier occasion, and I repeat again, if there's anyone who can be called a terrorist, it should be George W. Bush. He has declared a war, and it is not a war according to law. It is an unjust war, and not according to the international law. And everyone has a right to protest against that war. If anyone could protest, anyone could condemn that kind of war, be a Hindu, Christian, Muslim, fundamentalist, or otherwise, you have a right to protest. Just because we protest and condemn, we cannot be considered as terrorists. One of the most difficult problems is to define terrorism. See, we talk of terrorism, terrorism, terrorism. Where is the definition of terrorism? How do you define terrorism? Tada did not define terrorism. Porta did not define terrorism. Only terrorist acts were defined. And those acts could be even under the Indian Penal Court. They're not different. Murder, killing, decoity using guns, all are under the ordinary law. But you can, the, at the discretion of the police, they can use it as an act of terrorism under Tata law. If it could be broadly agreed that the deliberate killing of innocent civilians, you find this kind of de definition in the, in the dictionary, if it could be agreed that the deliberate killing of innocent civilians is a central element in most definitions of terrorism, then in that event, the worst terrorists of the last century should be the USA for bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, <laughs> where suffering of large number of innocent people has never been healed even after six decades. Just kill blacks of people in these two places. So also, the worst violators of the 21st century as it began are the USA and Great Britain. There's not much difference between George W. Bush and Luxury Tab Taiba. Both believe in killing. Killing helps them. Killing keeps alive the tension in this region. That is what they want. That is their business. So the USA has a business of encouraging killing, killing everywhere. It gives them a market. 
It gives them a market for supply of arms. So also luxury Taiba believe in killing. It gives them a market. So while both seek to wield power, one, of course, with the superior in power of USA, and the other, of course, trying to build up his own uh, other category of power. So it has become the global war. In this way, I think terrorism becomes a permanent feature of these persons. In other words, the permanent feature of American policy is a global war. It will never come to an end. As long as the fear of terrorism is there, they're happy. As a result of this, what is happening in the rest of the world is that freedom and liberty gets curtailed. We are now gradually sliding into what is called a security society. Today, as you must have seen, as we walked in, what happened to all of us? Everyone had to have a checkup. You could, because security, internal security. So we are going into a security society. Security is more important, not liberty. Your security. And then you must have read in the paper what is called Advanced Passenger Information System. You get into a plane in London. Within 15 minutes, your full history is sent to Bombay or whichever the destination. When you land there, the police are there. Police know your full history. You've gone to Dubai half a dozen times. OK, that is enough. They could do anything they like. For example, what happened in uh, Amsterdam, you see, you all know. They saw some people, people behaving in the, in the plane, people behaving in a very suspicious way. Their appearance, their dress, their speaking language, looking like Arabs, looking at watch frequently, bearded Muslims, and uh, burqa-clad women. OK, all these are suspicious, suspicious character, this kind of thing. So security becomes more important. And this is a kind of policing that goes on. And the, as a result of that, we have uh, all sorts of things that go on in this country, everywhere, because under security society, the police can do anything they like. Other day, you must have read the Antep Hill. Somebody was found in a building which was supposed to have been neglected. Nobody was there. What happened was, the police suddenly found he was a Pakistani, they said. One doesn't know. They went and shot him, killed him. Nobody, no proof, nothing of the kind. So because the neighbor security, the society accepted. Society did not protest. Who was killed? Nobody knows. So the police again believe in this guy because that helps them. They, they don't have to prove a case. They can detain anyone, keep him inside the police station, days together without a charge without anything, in the name of investigation. In fact, the other day, I went to the Minority Commission. What happened was people are just being rounded up and taken to, taken to the police station. What is the law? If you are taken to the police station, if you are a witness, of course, your statement has to be recorded, and then you have to go home. If you are not a witness, you are a suspect, then your name should be there somewhere. Your name should be in the FIR, or they should have advanced information. But they just can't take you to the police station and say, you are a suspect, you don't know anything about me. But you are a suspect. You keep me. You torture me inside. You keep me for days together. No station diary entry. No report. And one fine day, you handcuff that man with another unknown person who is supposed to come from Pakistan. And they say, you are connected with this two together. This is a kind of system. So in the name of security today, police can do whatever they like. Anyone can be killed in an encounter. That's a no investigation. In the name of security, Every movement of yours can be, can be tracked. Your bank accounts, for example, your transactions, all come under the, under the check. In the name of security, see, the other day the rule has come. In Bombay City, you can't sell or buy property. You can't rent out your house. You want to rent out, you have to go and inform, inform uh, the police officer. Uh, so the police have to be informed. So liberty is becoming a casualty. You are literally going to be enslaved. Soon, if this kind is encouraged, ultimately, you slowly, slowly, your rights are being taken away. Your liberty is being taken away. You are enslaved. This is a kind of thing. And I tell you, this is not something new. When Tara was introduced, also introduced for the sake of security, it was the Supreme Court, though it's a draconian law, unjust law, after Manaka Gandhi's case, nobody could have upheld that kind of law. Yet the Supreme Court upheld that law. Again, in the name of internal security. 
in the name of security. That is the main consideration. They upheld FOTA law, again in the name of security. They upheld Armed Forces Special Powers Act, which has had havoc in northeastern states, Manipur and so on, those places. Yet we upheld the law in the name of security. All of principles of uh, the liberal society, justice, social, economic, everything, all those they have forgotten. This is a kind of approach. So this is, therefore, it is necessary. We must understand this violence must come to an end. So what is the solution? Solution is not arms. Solution is not violence. Violence against what me from the people or from the state. No. What is required is that why should there be so much violence in the society? Our approach should be why there is this kind of terrorism. What is the reason for that? That is the thing the government must understand. Not arms, not kind of this kind of harsh law. I tell you, there is so much of injustice in the society. Go to any part of India, anywhere. So, so much of injustice. The rich and the powerful can get away with impunity. They can, nothing happens to them. America can invade any country. Nothing happens to them internationally. Within India, the rich and powerful are not bothered. They don't go in for voting, but they get whatever they want. But the poor, what happens to the poor? The marginalized. Huge projects, for example. We have built huge projects. I, can, I got details of statistics if you want, I can give them. What happens to them? Narmada Dam is the simplest example. Came up, came up. What happened to the people who were affected? Large number of tribals, what happened to them? They had lost their land, lost everything, yet nothing happened to them. What should they do? In Bombay, we have 40 lakhs or more people live in slums. What is the government doing? Government is demolishing them. Your right to housing. Internationally recognized right to housing, right to shelter, part of universal declared human rights, international covenant, civil and political, economic, social, cultural rights. All these are forgotten. Supreme Court has said repeatedly in the past, Article 21, right to life includes everything that goes with human dignity. Your food, your clothing, your shelter, your health, your education. What are we doing today? Everything we are not bothering. The government thinks it is not his business. The government thinks it is not their job. They are slowly abdicating their responsibilities. In a situation like what should the people do? If you are thrown away from your house, you don't get justice in a court of law, what do you do? In Vidarbha, a large number of people committing suicide, repeated approaches, repeated appeals. Government is indifferent, government is doing nothing. What should the people do? These are the questions. How do you answer? I remember once, Arundhati Roy said, in a situation like this, where people get no justice, nothing happens to them. At that time, what happened to them is they refused to take this into account. I remember I went to Gujarat after the riots. Large number of young children have seen their mothers and sisters being raped and burnt. Nobody guided them. Nobody gave them education. Nobody gave them any psychiatric uh, treatment or anything. The trauma was there. What should they do? Who gave them justice? Could the system give justice or not? I do not justify taking arms, but a government has a responsibility. The government must take it to account. Because if you don't care for the victims, the victims will try to take care of things by themselves. And that is the point. And so what Arundhati Rai said was, when victims refuse to be victims, they are called terrorists. So you are all victims of the unjust thing that is going on in this country, in this society. We must, government must take a major role, not by bringing harsh law, not by creating counter-terrorist wardens, not by blaming a particular community or anything, not by doors, but taking care of human rights, your right to food, your right to shelter, your right to education, right to health, right to a living livelihood. If these things are taken care of automatically, there will be change in the society. I think that is the goal that I want to tell you. Thank you very much for giving me this chance. Thank you. Thank you, Justice Hosbeth Suresh, for your frank judgmental comments on the injustice that we see around us exposing reality before our audience is well appreciated by all present here. Once again in earnest, on behalf of the Islamic Research Foundation, I welcome each one of you present here at this interesting and serious talk. 
It would be followed by an open question and answer session in which you can ask Dr. Zakir Naik any question on the topic. As concerns about the causes and effects of terrorism rise, as distinguishing between war and peace, religion and politics gets difficult. As media reports instill in us a fear psychosis and Islamophobia amongst billions of people worldwide, we all wonder, and so does the world around Muslims, is terrorism a Muslim monopoly? Our speaker for today, Dr. Zakir Naik, is the president of the Islamic Research Foundation in Mumbai and a medical doctor, an internationally acclaimed orator on Islam and comparative religion. Dr. Zakir Naik has delivered more than 1,000 public talks worldwide in the last 10 years. He appears regularly on many international TV channels in over 150 countries. Brothers and sisters, addressing the notion, is terrorism a Muslim monopoly? All yours, Dr. Zakir Naik. Alhamdulillah. Wa salatu wa salam. Ala Rasulillah wa ala ali wa sahbihi ajma'in. Amma abad. A'udhu billahi minash shaitani rajim. Bismillahir Rahman Rahim. وَقُلْ جَاءَ الْحَقِّ وَزَاكِ الْبَاطِلِ إِنَّ الْبَاطِلَ كَانَ نَزْهُوكَ رَبِّ شُوَهْ لِي صَدْرِي وَيَسِرْ لِي أَمْرِي وَحَلُّ الْأُقْدَةَ مِنْ لِسَانِ يَفْقَهُ كَوْلِي Honorable Justice Hasbir Suresh, my respected elders, and my dear brothers and sisters, I welcome all of you with the Islamic greetings. As-salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. May peace, mercy, and blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of Almighty God, be on all of you. The topic of this evening's talk is, is terrorism a Muslim monopoly? First, let us understand what is the meaning of the word terrorism. It is very difficult to define the word terrorism. There are various different definitions, and many of them contradict. The definition is intangible. It keeps on changing depending upon the geographical location and the historical fact. It is very difficult to define terrorism. But according to the Oxford Dictionary, it says that terrorism is a use of violent action to get and fulfill a political aim or to force a government to act. This word terrorism was initially first time coined in 1790s during the French Revolution. And it was in 1790s that the statesman, Edwin Burke, who was a British statesman, he used this word to describe the Jacobin-ruled French regime. And the years 1793 and 1794, it was called the reign of terror, the years of terror. And Maximilian Robespierre, he was heading this government. And during that time, he has killed thousands of people. He has guillotined thousands of innocent human beings. Historical records tell us that he had arrested more than 500,000 human beings out of which 40,000 he has executed. More than 200,000 were deported, and more than 200,000, they were starved and tortured to death in the prisons. So this word terrorism initially was coined to describe the people during the French Revolution. Today, we have in the international media, there is a very common statement which is repeatedly bombarded, especially in the Western media. And that statement is, all Muslims are not terrorists, but all terrorists are Muslims. And this statement was even imported to India, especially after the 11th of July, the serial train bomb blast that took place in Bombay, especially to Bombay. And we find that even in India, especially in Bombay, 
people kept on repeating the statement that all Muslims are not terrorists, but all terrorists are Muslims. Let us analyze today what do the historical records tell us, and what does the data on terrorist attack that is available in World History, what do they tell us? When we look at the records in 19th century, we can hardly find any terrorist attacks have been done by Muslims. Time does not permit me to speak about the details of the attacks taking place in the 19th century. I'll just mention a couple of them. We know that in 1881, Tsar Alexander II of Russia, he was assassinated. He was traveling in a bulletproof carriage in St. Petersburg Street. There was a bomb that kills innocent 21 bystanders. He comes out of the bulletproof carriage, another bomb comes, and he's killed. He was not killed by a Muslim. He was killed by Ignis. He was a Pole from Burbusk. He was a non-Muslim. He was an anarchist. We know in 1886, there was a bomb blast that took place in the hay market in Chicago during the labor rally. And 12 innocent people were killed. One amongst them was a policeman by the name of Dijin. Later on, seven policemen were injured, and they died in the hospital. The people responsible for this act, they were not Muslims. There were eight anarchists, all of them non-Muslims. When we analyze the record of the terrorist attacks that have taken place in the 20th century, we know from the historical records that on the 6th of September, 1901, the then president of USA, William McKinley, he was assassinated by an anarchist by the name of Leon. He was shot twice by Leon. He was a non-Muslim. On the 1st of October, 1910, there was a bomb blast that took place in the Los Angeles Times newspaper building, in which 21 innocent people were killed. The people responsible for this bomb blast, there were two Christians by the name of James and Joseph. They were union leaders. They were non-Muslims. We know that on the 28th of June, 1914, in Sarvajo, France, the Archduke of Austria, along with his wife, they were assassinated, which precipitated the World War I. The people responsible for this assassination, they were called the Young Bosnia. Most of them, they were Serbs. They were non-Muslims. From historical record, we come to know that on the 16th of April, 1925, there was a bomb blast that took place in St. Nedelia Church in Sofia, the capital of Bulgaria, in which more than 150 innocent people were killed and more than 500 injured. It was the biggest terrorist attack that has taken place on the soil of Bulgaria. It was conducted by the Bulgarian Communist Party. They were non-Muslims. We know from historical records that on the 9th of October, 1934, King Alexander I of Yugoslavia, he was assassinated by a gunman by the name of Lada Georgiev. He was a non-Muslim. The first US plane to be hijacked, it was not by a Muslim, it was by a non-Muslim by the name of Ortiz. He hijacked the US airliner to Cuba, and he later on got their asylum. When we go to the records of terrorist attacks done, we come to know that in the year 1968, the ambassador to Guatemala, he was assassinated by a non-Muslim. In 1969, the ambassador to Japan, he was knifed by a Japanese non-Muslim. The ambassador to Brazil in 1969, he was kidnapped by a non-Muslim. The famous attack, the Oklahoma bombing, which took place on 19th of April, 1995, where there was a truck loaded with a bomb, which rammed into the federal building in Oklahoma, which killed 166 innocent human beings. And hundreds other were injured. Initially, it came in the press, Middle East conspiracy, for days together. Later on, they came to know it were two right-wing activists, Christians by the name of Timothy and Terry, who were responsible for the bombing of the federal building in Oklahoma. But when this news comes, it comes for a couple of days and then it vanishes. But before, for several days, Middle East conspiracy, Middle East conspiracy. 
After World War II, from 1941 to 1948, in a span of eight years, 259 terrorist attacks were conducted by Jewish terrorists. But many organizations, Ignun, Stern Gang, Haganah, and we know of the famous bombing of King David Hotel, which took place on the 22nd of July, 1946. They were conducted by Ignun under the leadership of Menekin Begin, in which 91 innocent people were killed, out of which 28 were British, 41 were Arabs, 17 Jews, and five others. The Ignun group, they dressed up as Arabs to show as though Muslims did the bombing. And the person responsible was Menekin Begin. And it was the biggest terrorist attack against the history of British mandate, in which 91 people were killed. And at that time, Menekin Begin, he was called as terrorist number one by the British government. Later on, after a few years, he becomes the Prime Minister of Israel. And later on, after a few years, he gets the Nobel Prize for Peace. Imagine, a person who has killed, a person who has killed hundreds and thousands of innocent human beings, becomes the Prime Minister of Israel and later on gets the Nobel Prize for Peace. And most of the groups that were fighting, like Stern Gang, Ignun, Haganah, all of these Jewish groups, and the leaders, like Yatisak Sribin, Menekin Begin, Ariel Sharon, later on became prime ministers and high holding ranks in the state of Israel. And all of them, they were fighting for a Jewish state. If you see the world map, before 1945, Israel did not exist. Israel didn't exist. These Jewish groups, they were called as terrorists by the Britishers. They fought for a Jewish state. Later on, with power, they grabbed the land and they kicked the Palestinians out. And now these same people are calling the same Palestinians who are fighting for a more just cause, for getting the land back. And they are labeled today as terrorists by the Israelis. <laughs> Imagine Hitler insulated six million Jews. He kicks the Jewish community out. Why should they come to Palestine? The Palestinians, they welcome the cousins with open hands. If they should take a land, they should go back to Germany. They should go back to Europe. Imagine the Palestinians, they welcome the cousins. Imagine, suppose a visitor comes to your house. Being a stranger, you welcome him in your house. After a few days, he kicks you out of the house. And when you cry at the doorstep, I want my house back, people call you a terrorist. <laughs> This is exactly what has happened today. The Palestinians, they are called as terrorists. For what? They only want their land back. And so-called people, most of these powerful first world countries, they are agreeing with this unjust cause. We know that in Germany, from historical records, from 1968 to 1992, the Badenhof gang, they killed several innocent human beings. In Italy, we come to know from records about the Red Brigades, which has killed several innocent human beings. They were also responsible for kidnapping the Prime Minister of Italy, Aldo Moro. And after 55 days, they killed him. Further, when we come, a similar gang, a similar terrorist outfit, we know, was also in Japan. The Japanese Red Army. They were Buddhist cult. Om Shirito, they were Buddhist cult. And they tried to kill thousands of people in the Tokyo subway by the nerve gas. But unfortunately, they weren't very successful. They were only able to kill 12 people, but more than 5,700 innocent human beings, they were injured and wounded because of this nerve gas. They were Buddhists. In the UK, for about 100 years, the IRA, Irish Republican Army, they are conducting attacks against the UK. They are Catholics. But they are never called as Catholic terrorists, they are called as IRA. And we know they have conducted several terrorist attacks. Only in 1972, three bomb blasts were done. In the first one, seven people were killed. In the second one, 11 were killed. And third one, nine were killed. In 1974, they did two bomb blasts. In the Guildford pub, they killed five innocent people and injured 44 people. In the Birmingham pub, 21 innocent people were killed by the bomb blast and 182 were injured. 
Time doesn't permit me to speak about all the activities they did. I'm just mentioning a few, just at random. In 1996, they did a bomb blast in London where two people were killed and more than 100 were injured. Further, in 1996, a bomb blast was done in the shopping area of Manchester where 206 people were injured. In 1998, Bambridge bomb blast, where 500 pounds of bomb was loaded in a car in which 35 innocent people were injured. In the same year, we know from records about the OMAC bomb blast, where a 500 pound of bomb was put in a car and 29 innocent people were killed and 330 were injured. All these records are from non-Muslim sources. They have not been written by Muslims. <laughs> All from non-Muslim sources, from Amnesty Report, from BBC. If you go on the internet, you can cross-check. But many a time when the number is big, there may be a difference. Like today we know how many people killed, 296, one report says 294, one says 293, so I played safe and say more than 290. The report, if it's a large number, may differ by a few here and there. If it's a small number, it's precise. All these by non-Muslim sources. In 2001, the BBC was born by IRA. But these people, they are not called as Catholic terrorists. Today, the UK government is more afraid of Muslim terrorists. I don't know from the records of the UK government how many confirmed Muslim terrorists have done bomb blasts in UK. Even the London bombing of 7th July, there's no confirmed report. They are suspected to be Muslims. It's not confirmed, in which more than 50 people were killed. One report says 52, one report says 56. Therefore, I said more than 50 people were killed. Even if you agree for sake of argument that they were Muslims who did the 7th July bomb blast in the year 2005, yet, they come nowhere close to IRA. IRA puts these bomb blasts to shame. They have killed hundreds and thousands of people. Yet today, the UK government is more afraid. IRA is doing since more than 100 years. But because of the advice of George Bush, Tony Blair is more afraid of the Muslim terrorists rather than the problem which is there for more than 100 years. We know from historical records that in Spain and France, the terrorist organization is ETA. They have conducted 36 attacks. And in Africa, there are so many organizations, the list is exhaustive. But the one which is worth noting, and one of the most notorious, is called as the Lord's Salvation Army. It's a Christian terrorist organization. They train young children to commit terrorist attacks. Today, we have in the international media, there is a very common statement which is repeatedly bombarded, especially in the Western media. And that statement is, all Muslims are not terrorists, but all terrorists are Muslims. And this statement was even imported to India, especially after the 11th of July, the serial train bomb blast that took place in Bombay, especially to Bombay. And we find that even in India, especially in Bombay, people kept on repeating the statement that all Muslims are not terrorists, but all terrorists are Muslims. Let us analyze today what do the historical records tell us and what does the data on terrorist attack that is available in World history, what do they tell us? When we look at the records, in 19th century, we can hardly find any terrorist attacks have been done by Muslims. Time does not permit me to speak about the details of the attacks taking place in the 19th century. I'll just mention a couple of them. We know that in 1881, Tsar Alexander II of Russia, he was assassinated. He was traveling in a bulletproof carriage in St. Petersburg Street. There was a bomb that kills innocent 21 bystanders. He comes out of the bulletproof carriage, another bomb comes, and he's killed. He was not killed by a Muslim. He was killed by Ignis, he was a Pole from Burbusk. He was a non-Muslim, he was an anarchist. We know in 1886, there was a bomb blast that took place in the hay market in Chicago during the labor rally. And 12 innocent people were killed. One amongst them was a policeman by the name of Dijin. Later on, seven policemen were injured and they died in the hospital. The people responsible for this act, they were not Muslims. There were eight anarchists, all of them non-Muslims. When we analyze the record of the terrorist attacks that have taken place in the 20th century, we know from the historical records that 
on the 6th of September, 1901, the then president of USA, William McKinley, he was assassinated by an anarchist by the name of Leon. He was shot twice by Leon. He was a non-Muslim. On the 1st of October, 1910, there was a bomb blast that took place in the Los Angeles Times newspaper building, in which 21 innocent people were killed. The people responsible for this bomb blast, they were two Christians by the name of James and Joseph. They were union leaders. They were not Muslims. We know that on the 28th of June, 1914, in Sarvajo, France, the Archduke of Austria, along with his wife, they were assassinated, which precipitated the World War I. The people responsible for this assassination, they were called the Young Bosnia. Most of them, they were Serbs. They were not Muslims. From historical record, we come to know that on the 16th of April, 1925, there was a bomb blast that took place in St. Nedelia Church in Sofia, the capital of Bulgaria, in which more than 150 innocent people were killed and more than 500 injured. It was the biggest terrorist attack that has taken place on the soil of Bulgaria. It was conducted by the Bulgarian Communist Party. They were not Muslims. We know from historical records that on the 9th of October, 1934, King Alexander I of Yugoslavia, he was assassinated by a gunman by the name of Lada Georgiev. He was a non-Muslim. The first US plane to be hijacked, it was not by a Muslim, it was by a non-Muslim by the name of Otis. He hijacked the US airliner to Cuba, and he later on got their asylum. When we go to the records of terrorist attacks done, we come to know that in the year 1968, the ambassador to Guatemala, he was assassinated by a non-Muslim. In 1969, the ambassador to Japan, he was knifed by a Japanese a non-Muslim. The ambassador to Brazil in 1969, he was kidnapped by a non-Muslim. The famous attack, the Oklahoma bombing, which took place on 19th of April, 1995, where there was a truck loaded with a bomb, which rammed into the federal building in Oklahoma, which killed 166 innocent human beings. And hundreds of others were injured. Initially, it came in the press, Middle East conspiracy, for days together. Later on, they came to know it were two right-wing activists, Christians, by the name of Timothy and Terry, who were responsible for the bombing of the federal building in Oklahoma. But when this news comes, it comes for a couple of days and then it vanishes. But before, for several days, Middle East conspiracy, Middle East conspiracy. After World War II, from 1941 to 1948, in a span of eight years, 259 terrorist attacks were conducted by Jewish terrorists. By many organizations, Ignun, Stern Gang, Haganah, and we know of the famous bombing of King David Hotel, which took place on the 22nd of July, 1946. They were conducted by Ignun under the leadership of Menekin Begin, in which 91 innocent people were killed, out of which 28 were British, 41 were Arabs, 17 Jews, and five others. The Ignun group, they dressed up as Arabs to show as though Muslims did the bombing. And the person responsible was Menekin Begin. And it was the biggest terrorist attack against the history of British mandate, in which 91 people were killed. And at that time, Menekin Begin, he was called as terrorist number one by the British government. Later on, after a few years, he becomes the Prime Minister of Israel. And later on, after a few years, he gets the Nobel Prize for Peace. Imagine, a person who has killed... A person who has killed hundreds and thousands of innocent human beings becomes the Prime Minister of Israel and later on gets the Nobel Prize for Peace. And most of the groups that were fighting, like Stern Gang, Ignun, Haganah, all of these Jewish groups and the leaders, like Yatisak Suribin, 
Menekin Begin, Ariel Sharon, later on became prime ministers and high holding ranks in the state of Israel. And all of them, they were fighting for a Jewish state. If you see the world map, before 1945, Israel did not exist. Israel didn't exist. These Jewish groups, they were called as terrorists by the Britishers. They fought for a Jewish state. Later on, with power, they grabbed the land and they kicked the Palestinians out. And now these same people are calling the same Palestinians who are fighting for a more just cause, for getting the land back. And they are labeled today as terrorists by the Israelis. <laughs> Imagine Hitler insulated six million Jews. He kicks the Jewish community out. Why should they come to Palestine? The Palestinians, they welcome the cousins with open hands. If they should take a land, they should go back to Germany. They should go back to Europe. <laughs> Imagine the Palestinians, they welcome the cousins. Imagine, suppose a visitor comes to your house. Being a stranger, you welcome him in your house. After a few days, he kicks you out of the house. And when you cry at the doorstep, I want my house back, people call you a terrorist. <laughs> This is exactly what has happened today. The Palestinians, they are called as terrorists. For what? They only want the land back. And so-called people, most of these powerful first world countries, they are agreeing with this unjust cause. We know that in Germany, from historical records, from 1968 to 1992, the Badr-Benhoff gang, they killed several innocent human beings. In Italy, we come to know from records about the Red Brigades, which has killed several innocent human beings. They were also responsible for kidnapping the Prime Minister of Italy, Aldo Moro. And after 55 days, they killed him. Further, when we come, a similar gang, a similar terrorist outfit, we know, was also in Japan. The Japanese Red Army. They were Buddhist cult. Om Shiruto, they were Buddhist cult. And they tried to kill thousands of people in the Tokyo subway by the nerve gas. But unfortunately, they weren't very successful. They were only able to kill 12 people, but more than 5,700 innocent human beings, they were injured and wounded because of this nerve gas. They were Buddhist. In UK, for about 100 years, the IRA, Irish Republican Army, they are conducting attacks against UK. They are Catholics. But they are never called as Catholic terrorists, they are called as IRA. And we know they have conducted several terrorist attacks. Only in 1972, three bomb blasts were done. In the first one, seven people were killed. In the second one, 11 were killed. And third one, nine were killed. In 1974, they did two bomb blasts. In the Guildford pub, they killed five innocent people and injured 44 people. In the Birmingham pub, 21 innocent people were killed by the bomb blast and 182 were injured. Time doesn't permit me to speak about all the activities they did. I'm just mentioning a few, just at random. In 1996, they did a bomb blast in London where two people were killed and more than 100 were injured. Further, in 1996, a bomb blast was done in the shopping area of Manchester where 206 people were injured. In 1998, Bambridge bomb blast, where 500 pounds of bomb was loaded in a car, in which 35 innocent people were injured. In the same year, we know from records about the OMAC bomb blast, where a 500 pound of bomb was put in a car, and 29 innocent people were killed, and 330 were injured. All these records are from non-Muslim sources. They have not been written by Muslims. <laughs> All from non-Muslim sources, from Amnesty Report, from BBC. If you go on the internet, you can cross-check. But many a time when the number is big, there may be a difference. Like today we know how many people killed? 296, one report says 294, one says 293, so I played safe and say more than 290. The report, if it's a large number, may differ by a few here and there. If it's a small number, it's precise. All these by non-Muslim sources. In 2001, the BBC was born by IRA. But these people, they are not called as Catholic terrorists. Today, the UK government is more afraid of Muslim terrorists. I don't know from the records of the UK government how many confirmed Muslim terrorists have done bomb blasts in UK. Even the London bombing of 7th July, there's no confirmed report. They are suspected to be Muslims. It's not confirmed. In which more than 50 people were killed. One report says 52, one report says 56. Therefore, I said more than 50 people were killed. 
even if we agree for sake of argument that they were Muslims who did the 7th July bomb blast in the year 2005, yet they come no way close to IRA. IRA puts these bomb blasts to shame. They have killed hundreds and thousands of people. Yet today, the UK government is more afraid. IRA is doing since more than 100 years. But because of the advice of George Bush, Tony Blair is more afraid of the Muslim terrorists rather than the problem which is there for more than 100 years. We know from historical records that in Spain and France, the terrorist organization is ETA. They have conducted 36 attacks. And in Africa, there are so many organizations, the list is exhaustive. But the one which is worth noting, and one of the most notorious, is called as the Lord's Salvation Army. It's a Christian terrorist organization. They train young children to commit terrorist attacks. When we come to Sri Lanka, we know of the LTTE, Tamil Tigers. They are supposed to be one of the most notorious, most violent of all the terrorist organizations in the world. They are the people who are experts in suicide bombing. And they even take help of children. They train them and they let them take part in suicide bombing. Normally people are known that the Palestine is suicide bombing, Iraq is suicide bombing. If you historical record, the people who have popularized suicide bombing are the LTTE, Tamil Tigers. Who are they? They are Hindus. But the Indian report doesn't say Hindu terrorists, they say LTTE. When we come to India, many a times, most of the terrorist attacks that we hear of, majority of them, they talk about Kashmiri militants. Whether the attacks are right or wrong, we can discuss some other time. But how many times do we hear? And what Justice Hospital Sarai said, he named many of the terrorist attacks taking place in India. I wonder how many of the people in the audience have heard of them in the newspapers? How many? Those people who are involved, like honorable people like Justice Hasbir Suresh, and those in the field are aware of it. But the general masses, we aren't aware of it. Whenever terrorist attacks are talked about, most often they're talked about Muslim terrorists. Why? In India, there are terrorist organizations belonging to almost all different religions. Almost all. We know of the Sikh terrorist organization, Brindanwala Group in Punjab, we know that the Indian government on the 5th of June, 1984, they took over the Golden Temple in which 100 human beings were killed. In retaliation, a few months later, on 31st of October, 1984, the then Prime Minister, Srimad Indira Gandhi, she was assassinated by one of her security guards who was the Sikh. If you go to the South Asian terrorism hotel site, not run by Muslims, run by non-Muslims, and you see the list of terrorist attacks done by all the people, the Muslims are in a minority. But that's never highlighted in the media. If you go to northeast of India, if you go to Tripura, the Christian terrorist organization exists, like ATTF, All Tripura, Tiger Force, NLFT, National Liberation Front of Tripura. They're Christians. They have killed several Hindus. Reports, if you go on the site, four Hindus killed, eight Hindus killed. On 2nd October 2004, 44 Hindus were killed and several were injured by this group. They were Christians. In Assam, Ulfa. Ulfa alone, in a span of the past 16 years, from 1990 to 2006, they have conducted successfully 749 terrorist attacks. They will put the Kashmiri militants to shame. 749 confirmed terrorist attacks. But when we read in the newspaper, we only know about the Kashmiri attacks. And I remember a couple of years back, I'm called, alhamdulillah, by God's grace, by several parts of India, from several parts of the world. I had many invitations from Kashmir, but is it the right time to go, yes or no? Finally, in September 2003, I decided to go to Kashmir. And there I gave a talk in Srinagar, and they told me, the organizers, that in the past 14 years, first time the government gave permission for a public talk. And they organized my talk in polo grounds in Kashmir, in which 100,000 people attended. In all this turmoil, and the government gave me security. I was wondering, why are these people with machine guns with me? I went off to the various sites, Gulmark, Pahalgam, gave talks, etc. Fine, I didn't think it was required. Later on, I happened to go to Assam to give talks. 
And the moment I land on the airport, I find security guards around me. I said, why? And there I thanked God, Alhamdulillah. If they would not have been there, I wouldn't have come back here. <laughs> I did not know. I did not know that so many terrorists are there in Assam. The Ulfa are trained only to target the Muslims. They are Hindus. How many times does the press, the media report about them? Because it's not tantalizing. These reports may come in the news brief. It does appear. News briefs, how many people note it? Never in the headlines. In news briefs. Amongst the organizations, there is organizations, the Naxalites. We know of the Maoists. The Maoists are communist. Number one terrorist attacks that have been done in India, maximum are by the Maoists. Only in Nepal, in the past seven years, they have conducted 99 terrorist attacks. And out of the 600 districts in India, according to the Indian government, according to the site on terrorism, they say that they are present in 150 districts of India. They have done terrorist attacks in one third parts of India. Number one, if you compare the people they have killed, the attacks they have done, compared to the Kashmir militants, it's no way comparable. The Maoists are a bigger danger for India, but yet we find that the government is more afraid of the Muslim terrorists. Why? The reason is George Bush. <laughs> Just a couple of days back, on the 9th of September, an article came in Times of India, not on the front page, inside, but quite a big article, that 875 rockets, a haul of ammunition, 875 rockets, which were supposed to be supplied to the Maoists, they were intercepted and they were confiscated, and 30 rocket launchers. Imagine it is the biggest haul in the history of India that any terrorist organization that the government has caught. 875 rockets, they can wage a war against the Indian Army. And the DGP of Andhra Pradesh in Hyderabad, he was shocked. He said that with these rocket launchers, they can attack any police station, any tanks, of the Indian government from a distance of 600 meters, from more than half a kilometer away, they can attack the Indian tanks, the Indian police station, and you can't do anything. Rocket launchers. Yet we see people are more afraid of people who have a beard, people are wearing a cap, people have trousers above the ankle. Are they more dangerous than the rocket launchers? Why? Why are they targeting the Muslims particularly? It's a question. It is a ploy of the Western media, the media controlled by the politicians. And when we analyze, we can surely say without any doubt that terrorism is not a Muslim monopoly. Not only is it not a Muslim monopoly, it is not even a speciality of the Muslims. It is not even encouraged by Islam. <laughs> It is prohibited in Islam. I, being a student of comparative religion, I cannot say that all the religions say that you should not kill innocent human beings. But I can surely say that most of the religions, the majority of the religions, if you read the scriptures, they say that you should not kill innocent human beings. And the leader of all these religions is Islam. Islam says, it's mentioned in the Quran, in Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 32, the ayat, the verse which was recited by the Qari, it says that if anyone, whether Muslim or non-Muslim, kills any other human being, whether Muslim or non-Muslim, it is as though he has killed the whole of humanity. I know of many religious scriptures which say that you should not kill innocent human beings. But Quran does not only say that, it says that if anyone kills any other human being, unless it be for murder or for creating corruption or for spreading mischief in the land, it is as though he has killed the whole of humanity. Quran goes a step further and says that if you kill any innocent human being, it is as though you have killed the whole of humanity. I don't know of any religious scripture which says that if you kill any innocent human being, it is as though you have killed the whole of humanity. And further Quran goes on to say that if you save, any single life, any single human being, it is as though you have saved the whole of humankind. <laughs> Islam is derived from the Arabic word salam or salam, which means peace. 
It comes from the Arabic word film, which means to submit your will to Almighty God. Islam, in short, means peace acquired by submitting your will to Almighty God. Islam condemns all forms of terrorism, all forms of acts which kill innocent human beings, irrespective whether it's 9 11, whether Twin Tower attack, or the 7th of July, where more than 50 innocent people were killed in London bomb blasts, the New York Towers, more than 3,000 people were killed. In the London bomb blast, more than 50 were killed. Or whether it be the serial bomb blast in 93 of Bombay, where more than 250 people were killed. Or the bomb blast that took place recently, on the 11th of July, 2006, where more than 200 people were killed, are to be condemned. It is prohibited. You cannot justify killing of any innocent human being. <laughs> many Muslims, many a times, to appease the government, they put a full stop there. I never put a full stop here. I continue and say, we also have to condemn the thousands of Afghanis that have been killed in Afghanistan, the thousands of innocent people that have been killed in Iraq, the thousands of people that are killed in Gujarat, the thousands of people killed in Palestine, thousands of people killed in Lebanon. We can't put a full stop. Who are you afraid of? All sorts of terrorism in which innocent human beings are killed have to be condemned, whether done by Muslims or non-Muslims. We don't have records that 9-11 or 7 July, or the recent serial bomb blast in the train, confirmed record done by Muslims. It is just a hypothesis. But irrespective, after we come to the truth, whether it's done by Muslim or non-Muslim, it is to be condemned. It is prohibited. We know that most of the religions, they don't preach that you should kill innocent human beings. Terrorism is not the monopoly of any religion. It is not. But when we analyze we have terrorists that claim to profess certain religions. And when we analyze, they are from all types of religions. We have Christian terrorists, we have Catholic terrorists, we have Jewish terrorists, we have Hindu terrorists, we have Muslim terrorists, we have Buddhist terrorists, we have Sikh terrorists. Terrorists professing very different faiths. But most of the religions, they condemn the killing of innocent human beings. And when we do a survey, that though we know that religions don't encourage killing innocent human beings. When we do a survey and try and find out that the people that have killed the maximum innocent human beings, which religion do you profess? Number one, the human being that has killed the maximum innocent human beings. Who is he? Who is he? Hitler. He has insinuated six million Jews. And indirectly, if you count all the people killed in the World War II, 60 million people. Number one, was he a Muslim? He was a Christian. Joseph Stalin, called as Uncle Joe, he has estimated to have killed 20 million human beings. He has starved 14.5 million human beings to death. When we go to China, Mao Zedong, he has killed 14 to 20 million human beings. He was a non-Muslim. He was not a Muslim. We know from record that Mussolini, in Italy alone, has killed 400,000 human beings, innocent human beings. The person after whom the French Revolution is named, Maximilien Robespierre, he has starved and tortured to death more than 200,000 people and executed more than 40,000 people. Ashoka, you know, in one battle alone, in Kalinga battle, he has killed 100,000 people, more than 100,000 people. Was he a Muslim? He was a Hindu. We have a own black sheep also. Rakosh Teller, the Saddam Hussein, is responsible for the death of a few hundred thousand people. But the embargo put by George Bush on Iraq alone has killed half a million children in Iraq alone. Half a million. In one shot, only on the embargo put by USA, UN on Iraq, half a million children have died. In Indonesia, Mohammed Sato, even he has claimed to have killed 500,000 people, but it's nothing compared to Hitler, nothing compared to Uncle Joe, Joseph Stalin, nothing compared to Mao Tse-Tung of China. Each individual will put all the Muslims together to shame. I'm not trying to say that the followers of this religion, they were practicing the religion, they were not religious. Otherwise, they wouldn't have ever killed innocent human beings. But yet we find in the international media we find that Muslims are being targeted. 
Muslims are called as fundamentalists, as extremists. They're called as terrorists. What is the meaning of the word fundamentalist? Fundamentalist, by definition, means a person who follows the fundamentals of one particular subject. For example, if a person wants to be a good scientist, he should know, follow, and practice the fundamentals of science. Unless he's a fundamentalist in the field of science, he can't be a good scientist. For a person to be a good mathematician, he should know, follow, and practice the fundamentals of maths. Unless he's a fundamentalist in the field of maths, he can't be a good mathematician. You can't paint all fundamentals the same brush, that all are good or all are bad. Depending in which field the person is a fundamentalist, you have to label him accordingly. If you have a fundamentalist robber whose profession is to rob, he's bad for the society. On the other hand, if you have a fundamentalist doctor who saves thousands of human beings, he's good for the society. So depending in which field the person is a fundamentalist, you have to label him accordingly. As far as I'm concerned, I am a fundamentalist Muslim, and I am proud to be a fundamentalist Muslim. <laughs> because I know, I follow, and I strive to practice the fundamentals of Islam. And I know that there is not a single fundamental of Islam which is against humanity as a whole. There may be, <laughs> there may be a few fundamentals of Islam, which the non-Muslim may feel is against humanity. But the moment you give the logical reason, the background for these fundamentals, there is not a single unbiased human being who can point out a single fundamental of Islam which is against humanity as a whole. <laughs> this word fundamentalism, we come to know from Webster Dictionary, that it was first coined to describe a group of Christians in the early part of the 20th century in America who protested against the church. They were called as Protestant Christians. Initially, the church, they believed that the message of the Bible is from God. These Protestant Christians, they protested and said, not only is the message of the Bible from God, every word, every letter of the Bible is from God. If someone can prove that every word, every letter of the Bible is from God, this movement is a good movement. On the other hand, if someone can prove that every word of the Bible is not from Almighty God, then this movement is not a good movement. When we refer to the Oxford Dictionary for the definition of the word fundamentalist, it says that fundamentalist is a person who strictly adheres to the ancient teachings and doctrines of any religion. But when we refer to the revised new edition, there's a slight change. The new edition says that fundamentalist is a person who strictly adheres to the ancient teachings and doctrines of any religion, especially Islam. <laughs> so the word especially Islam has been added to the revised definition. The moment you hear the word Muslim, you start thinking he's a fundamentalist, he's an extremist, He's a terrorist. And many of us Muslims, we go on the defense, I'm not a fundamentalist, I'm not an extremist. I say I'm an extremist. I'm extremely honest, I'm extremely just, I'm extremely kind, I'm extremely peaceful, I'm extremely merciful. <laughs> I want to know what is wrong in being extremely just, extremely honest, extremely kind, extremely merciful. You can't be partly just when it benefits you and if you're just. When it doesn't benefit you're not, you have to be extremely just. That's what the Quran says. Our religious scripture, the word of our mighty God, says we have to be fully just. We can't expect a judge to be partly just when he wants he does justice, otherwise no. So what's wrong? And I want to ask any human being, can he tell me that being extremely honest is wrong, extremely just is wrong, extremely peaceful is wrong? We have to be an extremist, but in the right direction. So when someone says I'm extremist, I have to be an extremist Muslim. Only if I'm an extremist Muslim can I be a good Muslim. Otherwise, I can't. I know these terminologies have been manipulated. The definitions keep on changing. But we have to turn the tables over. We can't partly follow the Quran. We have to extremely and completely follow the Quran. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 208, Allah says, Enter into Islam wholeheartedly. Today, Muslims, they label that terrorist. No Muslim should ever terrorize any innocent human being. It is prohibited in Islam. We know that many a times, two different labels are given for the same person, for the same individual, for the same activity, more than 60 years back, when India was being ruled by the British government. There were many Indians who were fighting for the freedom of the country. 
These Indians who were fighting for the freedom of the country by the British government, they were called as terrorists. But we common Indians, we call them as freedom fighters, as patriots. Same people, same activity, two different labels. If you agree with the view of the British government that they had a right to rule over India, then you have to call these people as terrorists. But if you agree with the view of the common Indians that the Britishers came to India to business, they have no right to rule over us, then you have to call them as patriots, as freedom fighters. These same very Britishers, they call Bhagat Singh, Chandrasekhar Azad, Subhash Chandra Bose as terrorists. Do we agree? Not at all. Just because the Britishers say, just because the Americans say, we don't have to believe, we have to fight for justice. They were patriots, they were freedom fighters. Therefore, before you give a label to any individual, you have to try and find out for what reason is he striving. We have several such examples in world history. Time does not permit us to give all the details. I'll just give one more example of the American Revolution, which took place in the 19th century. And we know in 1875, during the American Revolution, there were many Americans who were fighting for the freedom. The British were ruling America. And these people who fought for the freedom by the British government, they were called as terrorists. And number one in the forefront was Benjamin Franklin, George Washington. We know that these people by the British government, they were called as terrorists, number one. George Washington was called terrorist number one. Later on, he becomes the president of USA. And he happens to be the same terrorist number one. He becomes the president of USA and happens to be the godfather of all the presidents to come, including George Bush. <laughs> Imagine the same people who the British has called as terrorists. Now they're allies. They are the best friends. The time keeps on changing, depending upon historical background, depending upon geographical background. What we come to know, in short, whoever is in power, whatever label he gives, the label gets stuck. Whoever is in power. Today, America is supposed to be in power. They have the media with them. So who they call a terrorist, the label gets stuck. It gets stuck. I had gone to Australia in December 2001, just a couple of months after 9-11. And one of my first talks was in the city of Perth. I gave a talk on jihad and terrorism and Islamic perspective. The first question that was asked to me was by the American Consul General of Perth. And the first question he asked me, the Dr. Naik, do you consider Osama bin Laden to be a terrorist? And I told him, as far as Osama bin Laden is concerned, I don't know, I haven't met him, I haven't interrogated him, he is neither my friend, neither is my enemy. I cannot give the answer based on the news reports of BBC and CNN. If you want the answer based on BBC and CNN, you have no option but to say he's a terrorist. But the Quran says in Surah Jurat, chapter number 49, verse number 6, that whenever you get information, check it up before you pass it on to the second person. So therefore, as far as Osama bin Laden is concerned, I cannot say whether he's a terrorist or not. He's neither my friend, neither my enemy. I haven't integrated him. But what I can say very well, that we have got established proof very well from the same media controlled by them, from CNN, from BBC. We know that thousands of innocent Afghans have been killed in Afghanistan. Thousands of Iraqis have been killed in Iraq. Even if we agree, 9-11, they say, was done by Osama bin Laden. No proof. Hypothetical. When the Afghanistan government wants proof, George Bush gives it to Tony Blair. He gives it to Musharraf. <laughs> and normally, even if we agree, for sake of argument, Osama bin Laden did it, for sake of argument. But does it justify in killing thousands of innocent people? Normally, on international level, there's extradition policy that whenever any person who's a culprit in a country goes to another country, you can get him back. For example, India and UK have extradition policy. A few years back, one of the music director, Nadeem, according to Indian government, he was involved in murder. He goes and sits in UK. The Indian government has extradition policy with UK, but when they wanted him back, they said, prove it that he's a culprit. Many people from India went there. Our police force went there. They could not prove. They even had to pay for the lawyer charges of that Nadeem. <laughs> we know that in the Bhopal gas tragedy, we know that thousands of innocent Indians were killed. The person of Union Carbide goes to America and sits there. Imagine the Indian government attacking America, give the person back. Is it right? Why don't they do it? 
It is proved. Union carpet, thousands of innocent human beings killed, injured, wounded, damaged for life, families ruined, ran away. We have extradition policy, nothing happens. So Afghanistan and USA don't have extradition policy yet. Even if you agree, for sake of argument, Osama bin Laden did it, it is not justified killing of innocent human beings. More than three to 5,000 Afghans were killed. Then, after a couple of years, goes to Iraq, weapons of mass destruction. And they go there, after the attack, they don't find anything. Yet, they are controlling Iraq. What is the cause? What is the reason? And people in Iraq are more troubled. They were troubled with Saddam Hussein. You are not a good Muslim. You are not a practicing Muslim. I'm not in favor of Saddam Hussein. But the trouble they're facing after America has come to Iraq is multiple times more. More people are being robbed. More people are being raped. The main purpose is what? Is oil. oil. It's an open secret. <laughs> So I told the American consul general that time that according to me, number one terrorist in the world is George Bush. <laughs> and I'm a person who keeps on speaking very often. I had gone to Australia just a couple of months after 9-11. It comes as headlines in the newspaper at that time, December 2001. Dr. Zakir Naik calls himself a fundamentalist and says George Bush is terrorist number one. <laughs> I did not know of any speaker on a public level, I don't know, maybe, maybe, who has condemned George Bush as terrorist number one. Today, it is very common. I can name a hundred top personalities. And we know that the Honorable Justice Husband, I didn't know that even he considered. Rightly, he's an honest judge. And I agree with that. <laughs> I don't know when is the first time he said, I don't want to compete with him. He's more senior to me. I don't know when is the first time he said that. But now when we read records, we come to know that the president of Venezuela, Hago Chavez, he said that the biggest terrorist in the world is George Bush. The president-elect of Bovillia, Evo Morales, he said that George Bush is a terrorist. The famous singer and activist of America, Harry Belfont, he said the biggest terrorist in the world is George Bush. An MP in UK, an MP in UK by the name of George Galloway, he said the biggest terrorist in the world is George Bush. And he said that the blood that is there on the hands of George Bush and Tony Blair is much more than the bombers who have done bombing in London. And when you have asked, he said, it will be justified. George Galloway, who's MP in UK, he said, it will be justified that if a suicide bomber goes and attacks and kills Tony Blair without injuring any other innocent human being, that suicide bomber will be justified. Who said that? George Galloway. <laughs> we have Jyoti Basu, a few months back. He said, when George Bush came to India, that number one terrorist is George Bush. Everyone says that, but the Indian government wants to invite him. For what? So that we learn the art of terrorism? <laughs> Recently, a couple of days back, it was a news article in the newspapers that the Nobel Prize winner, Nobel Prize winner Betty Williams, she said that she would love to kill George Bush. <laughs> she would love to kill George Bush, which I differ. After one of the talks in London, which I gave on jihad and terrorism, there was a youngster Muslim who said that Allah Akbar, dead to George Bush. <laughs> there were many non-Muslims there, and a full talk, the impact went down. So I told him, if you see the history of a beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he prayed to Almighty God. There were two Umars who were staunchly against Islam. He prayed to Almighty God that at least let one of the Umar gets daya, they become Muslim, so that there will be a help for Islam. And we know the second caliph of Islam, Hazrat Tomar, may Allah be with him, he accepted Islam. The same way, I pray to Almighty God that at least Almighty God gives hidayah to George Bush. <laughs> or at least to one of them, George Bush or Tony Blair. <laughs> Imagine if there's so much staunch against Islam, if they accept Islam, what will happen? I am a dai. That's what I always do. Try and convince him about the good of Islam. People tell me, Brother Zakir, you travel throughout the world. Don't you have problems? 
Alhamdulillah, summa alhamdulillah, Allah's help. I know many of my colleagues who keep on traveling, they have had several problems. And my appearance, the beard, the cap, and a coat, though I look like a joker, it's a soft target. <laughs> but with God's grace, with Allah's grace, alhamdulillah, I never had problems. I spent time, many a times, with these immigration and police officers. I was there in New York two days before 9-11. I just left New York. I was there for two weeks. Alhamdulillah, summa alhamdulillah. Good, I left. If I'd been there during 9-11, maybe I would be implicated, possibly. I went to London immediately. And last time I was in USA, though I've been invited several times because of my tight schedule, I was in 2003. I'd gone to Los Angeles to receive an award. Immediately, I was prepared that during immigration, I'll be interrogated, the way I look. I'm mentally prepared. They asked me, why have you come here? I said to receive an award. Award for what? Do you belong to a charitable organization? What award are you getting? I said, to serve humanity. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said, speak the truth and the truth shall free you. I speak the truth. That's why I've got the award. And it went on the long conversation. Later on, I went to the customs, and I purposely say, I've come for an Islamic conference. Islamic conference, go for checking. <laughs> they opened my bag, and they see my video cassette. Terrorism and jihad. <laughs> and on that cover, there is a pistol. So the custom officer says, that, do you believe in jihad? I said, yes, I believe in jihad. Even Jesus Christ believed in jihad, in striving and struggling. No, 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 I mean, do you believe in fighting? I said, you read your Bible. If you read the Bible, the Bible speaks about fighting. If you read the book of Numbers, chapter number 31, verse number 1 to 19. The book of Exodus, chapter number 22, verse number 18 to 20. The book of Exodus, chapter number 32, verse number 27 to 28. And Jesus Christ, peace be upon himself, said, in the Gospel of Luke, chapter number 22, verse number 36, that take you the sword and go and fight. So immediately, most of the custom officers, eight or ten, gathered together, and they started asking, sir, can we ask you one more question? <laughs> so I just told my host on the mobile that please don't worry, I'm stuck up here, I'm just doing dawah. <laughs> I keep on traveling, mashallah. I've been to Australia, to UK several times. By God's grace, time I did spend, not more than a couple of hours. I know many of my colleagues were detained. Many of my colleagues means my speakers. I'm not talking about my Bombay speakers. I'm talking about the international speakers who keep on traveling. They have been detained. They have been deported. Allah's grace that so far I have not been detained. I have been deported. Maximum half an hour or dawa. And I see to it that whenever I get opportunity, I grab it. But I see to it that I quote the scriptures. I follow the guidance of the Quran in Surah Al-Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 64, which says, Ta'ala wila kalmitin sawa im bayna baynakum. Come to common terms as between us and you. So when we come to common terms, most of the problems are solved. In UK, an MP in UK by the name of George Galloway, he said the biggest terrorist in the world is George Bush. And he said that the blood that is there on the hands of George Bush and Tony Blair is much more than the bombers who have done bombing in London. And when you have asked, he said, it will be justified. George Galloway, who's MP in UK, he says, it will be justified that if a suicide bomber goes and attacks and kills Tony Blair without injuring any other innocent human being, that suicide bomber will be justified. Who said that? George Galloway. <laughs> we have Jyoti Basu. A few months back, he said, when George Bush came to India, that number one terrorist is George Bush. Everyone says that, but the Indian government wants to invite him. For what? So that we learn the art of terrorism? <laughs> Recently, a couple of days back, it was a news article in the newspapers that the Nobel Prize winner, Nobel Prize winner Betty Williams, she said that she would love to kill George Bush. <laughs> She would love to kill George Bush, which I differ. <laughs> After one of the talks in London, which I gave on jihad and terrorism, there was a youngster Muslim who said that Allah Akbar, dead to George Bush. <laughs> there were many non-Muslims there, and my full talk, the impact went down. So I told him, if you see the history of a beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he prayed to Almighty God. There were two Umars who were staunchly against Islam. He prayed to Almighty God that at least let one of the Umar get daya, they become Muslim, so that there will be a help for Islam. And we know the second caliph of Islam, Hazrat Umar, may Allah be with him, he accepted Islam. 
the same way I pray to Almighty God that at least Almighty God gives Hidayat to George Bush. <laughs> or at least to one of them, George Bush or Tony Blair. <laughs> Imagine if there's so much strong against Islam, if they accept Islam, what will happen? I'm a Dai. That's what I always do. Try and convince him about the good of Islam. People tell me, Brother Zakir, you travel throughout the world. Don't you have problems? Alhamdulillah, summa alhamdulillah, Allah's help. I know many of my colleagues who keep on traveling, they have had several problems. And my appearance, the beard, the cap, and a coat, though I look like a joker, it's a soft target. <laughs> but with God's grace, with Allah's grace, alhamdulillah, I never had problems. I spent time, many a times, with these immigration and police officers. I was there in New York two days before 9-11. I just left New York. I was there for two weeks. Alhamdulillah, summa alhamdulillah. Good, I left. If I'd been there during 9-11, maybe I would be implicated, possibly. I went to London immediately. And last time I was in USA, though I've been invited several times because of my tight schedule, I was in 2003. I'd gone to Los Angeles to receive an award. Immediately, I was prepared that during immigration, I'll be interrogated the way I look. I'm mentally prepared. They asked me, why have you come here? I said to receive an award. Award for what? Do you belong to a charitable organization? What award are you getting? I said, to serve humanity. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said, speak ye the truth and the truth shall free you. I speak the truth. That's why I've got the award. And it went on the long conversation. Later on, I went to the customs, and I purposely say, I've come for an Islamic conference. Islamic conference, go for checking. <laughs> they opened my bag, and they see my video cassette. Terrorism and Jihad. <laughs> and on that cover, there is a pistol. So the custom officer says, that, do you believe in jihad? I said, yes, I believe in jihad. Even Jesus Christ believed in jihad, in striving and struggling. No, 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 I mean, do you believe in fighting? I said, you read your Bible. If you read the Bible, the Bible speaks about fighting. If you read the book of Numbers, chapter number 31, verse number 1 to 19, the book of Exodus, chapter number 22, verse number 18 to 20, the book of Exodus, chapter number 32, verse number 27 to 28, and Jesus Christ, peace be upon himself, said, in the Gospel of Luke, chapter number 22, verse number 36, that take the sword and go and fight. So immediately, most of the custom officers, eight or 10 gathered together, and they started asking, sir, can we ask you one more question? <laughs> so I just told my host on the mobile that please don't worry, I'm stuck up here, I'm just doing dawah. <laughs> I keep on traveling, mashallah. I've been to Australia, to UK several times. By God's grace, time I did spend, not more than a couple of hours. I know many of my colleagues were detained. Many of my colleagues mean my speakers. I'm not talking about my Bombay speakers. I'm talking about the international speakers who keep on traveling. They have been detained. They have been deported. Allah's grace that so far I have not been detained. I haven't been deported. Maximum half an hour one hour dawa. And I see to it that whenever I get opportunity, I grab it. But I see to it that I quote the scriptures. I follow the guidance of the Quran in Surah Al-Imran, chapter number three, verse number 64, which says, Ta'ala wila kalmitin sawa im bayna baynakum. Come to common terms as between us and you. So when we come to common terms, most of the problems are solved. This talk, what we're having today, was supposed to be held more than a month back. I was supposed to be in London. That's why this talk is delayed. And when I landed on the 10th of August, on Heathrow Airport, and I received a call from my wife, Sakir, where are you? I said, why? No, why are you in the airport outside? What happened? I said, no, we just received information that there are some 21 Muslims arrested who are supposed to do bomb blasts, et cetera, et cetera. But alhamdulillah, I had my own camera crew with me. We were 12 of us. All of them, cap, beard, God's grace, we passed through very well. I had my talk in Birmingham. It was successful. Next day, sometimes we go and do shooting. So next day, we went to one of the Jewish graveyards and we were shooting. Shooting, not shooting, we were recording. <laughs> you know, we in our lingo, we say shooting means recording on the video camera. Just to get stock shot of the city. And we spent a couple of hours in the Jewish graveyard. Later on, we went to one of the church, did the recording shooting. Then we went for breakfast, and we came back to the hotel in the afternoon. Then we get information. The police of Birmingham, they're trying to track us down. Maybe some passerby went and complained. They were looking for seven or eight terrorists with cap and beard. Who are these people? <laughs> they had the number, plate, and they knew it was a green car. So what they did, they phoned the insurance company, and they tried to find out where we were, 
and finally they located us in the hotel. But luckily, while doing inquiry, they even happened to speak with the person who I had breakfast with, and he happened to be a very famous politician, Muslim politician. So when the chief of that area, of the police station, spoke to him, that you know we're looking for these terrorists. He said, what nonsense are you talking? Do you know, two months back, I had given a DVD of a person by the name of Dr. Zakir Naik. He said, yes, he's the same person. Oh, same person. <laughs> Problem solved. The passerbys who had reported, you know, beard is dangerous. Beard, cap, dangerous. You have to be careful. But again, God's help, Allah's help, and I'm safely back here, otherwise I wouldn't have been here to give the talk. We Muslims should not be afraid, we should speak the truth, but with hikmah. You have to be careful. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Nahal, chapter number 16, verse 125, Invite all to the way of thy Lord with wisdom and beautiful preaching and argue with them and reason with them in the ways that are best and most gracious. When we speak, you have to speak with hikmah. Now we realize, after seeing the scenario, that who has the monopoly on terrorism? And according to me, terrorism is a monopoly of the politicians. <laughs> according to my understanding and survey, terrorism is a monopoly of the politicians. Irrespective, they may be politicians of USA, of UK or India, it is the monopoly of the politicians. We have to realize what is the cause of terrorism. If we want to abolish terrorism, first you have to understand the root cause. I, being a doctor, we don't believe in symptomatic treatment. We believe in trying and finding out what is the cause and killing the germ. That's a better treatment. What is the cause of terrorism? The experts say that the cause of terrorism is injustice. When injustice is done on a particular group of people, when wrong is done on a particular group of people, they tend to retaliate. And that is the only cause of terrorism. And when we realize that whether it be the 9-11, the destruction of the Twin Towers in New York, whether it be the 7th July, the bombing in London, or the serial bomb blast, 93 in Bombay, or the recent bomb blast on 11th of July, whether it be the thousands of people killed in Afghanistan, in Iraq, in Gujarat, in Bosnia, whether it be in Palestine, in Lebanon, we find that behind them, the main cause are the politicians. I was wondering that when I landed in UK, that why were 21 young Muslims arrested? The government said we were keeping track on them for several months. Many people I met who knew these people were arrested personally. They said, impossible. They can't be involved. What we realize that the people wait, when should this news come out? At that time, Israel was attacking Lebanon. Thousands of people were killed. The Britishers were objecting. So then you have a diversion. 21 Muslims supposed to bomb the airline are arrested. It's a bigger news, so people forget about thousands of innocent people being killed in Lebanon. <laughs> Same thing in India, Kargil. Any problem politicians, talk about Kargil. Talk about the enemy, Pakistan. Diversion, politics. Whether it's been USA, whether it's been UK, whether it's been India. The major cause are the politicians. We know that our country, more than 60 years back, they were ruled by the Britishers, and they had a policy of divide and rule. More than 50 years back, we got freedom from the Britishers, but unfortunately, they have left, but they have left the policy behind. And our Indian politicians, they have adopted this policy of divide and rule. They adopt this policy of divide and rule for the vote bank. <laughs> from records, we come to know that the country which has the maximum rights Anywhere in the world, it is India. If not daily, at least once a week, we have communal rights. This great country of us, so many great religions are there. Maximum rights, communal rights. And the major cause, almost all, directly and indirectly, they are the politicians. For the vote bank, for the power, for the money. They engineer these things. Otherwise, normally, I have met non-Muslims. It's my job, it's my profession. I'm a student of comparative religion. I keep on meeting different sorts of people. Generally, the common Indian, irrespective of whether he's Hindu or a Muslim, they would love to live with each other harmoniously. They would love to live peacefully. 
We may have our differences. We don't want to fight. But it is these politicians. It is these politicians who engineer hatred amongst different religions so that they could fill the vote bank. And you see almost all the rights that have taken place, indirectly or directly, they are the cause. We know that a few years back, there was a political gimmick, the Babri Masjid and Ram Janbhumi issue. You know Babri Masjid and Ram Janbhumi issue in Ayodhya? I would like to know how many of us Muslims and Hindus knew about Babri Masjid and Ram Janbhumi before the politicians made it a gimmick. How many of us knew? I had never heard of this Babri Masjid. And when I asked the common Hindu, he had never heard of this. Only after the politicians made it a political gimmick, people knew about it. And we know on the 6th of December, 1992, they wanted to have a big procession, a gathering at this site. The Supreme Court had explicitly said that no gathering anywhere close to the disputed site. A group of politicians, they make it a political gimmick of Ram Janbhumi issue and the Babri Masjid issue. They want to gather on 6th of December. The ruling politicians know very well that they have the Supreme Court backing. They could have easily stopped the gathering, easily. But then they think, if I stop, I may lose vote. So they let the gathering take place. <laughs> the gathering takes place, and then they say, spontaneously, the thousands of cards were gathered there. Spontaneously, the Babri Masjid was destroyed, spontaneously. You know, there was live recording on the various satellite channels. We know that with trishuls and lathis, how can you get down a structure? Is it possible? No. They had planted explosives with this pre-planned act that planted explosives. Anyone can see. You don't have to be a specialist of military. You can see it with your eyes. That explosives were planted, and that's how the structure came down. Can the structure come down with lathis and trishuls? Maybe George Bush saw this. 6 December 1992, that's how he had conducted the inside job of 11 September. <laughs> Time does not permit me to speak about the inside job. That requires a lecture by itself, inside job of 11 September. Many Americans have spoken about that. Maybe he saw it and he got the idea that let's conduct in New York also. Later on, what happens? This emerges into rights. Throughout the country, there were rights. It is the largest right after partition in the whole country, where tens of thousands of innocent human beings were killed, mainly Muslims. Who's to blame? The innocent Indians. They are instigated by the politicians. Fight. Kill the opposite religion people. Instigated, innocent people, they get instigated, and they do the act. We know that even in Bombay, one of the cities that was maximum affected was Bombay. Even during partition, the riots that took place in Bombay was the worst in the history of Bombay. Even during partition, so many people were not killed as during the December 92 and January 93 riots. The police, if they wanted, they could have easily prevented the riot, very easy. With the backing of the reserve police, with the backing of the military, easily they could have done it, but they did not do it. Most of them were silent spectators. Some were good, they tried, but they were in a minority. Majority were silent spectators, some were party to it. I'm aware that even the police is controlled by the politicians. So the police wants to do something, the politicians come in between. So the blame goes back to the politicians. Later on, the government appoints a single judge commission to appease the minority. And they appointed Justice Sri Krishna. It was famously called as the Sri Krishna Commission. And we know that Justice Sri Krishna, he was and is a devout and a practicing Hindu. But at the same time, he's an upright and honest judge, just like how we have Justice Suresh here. <laughs> an honest and an upright judge. The verdict he gave, it did not go down the throat of the government. It takes a few years. And he had analyzed the full cases of the right. He spoke with the politicians, with the police. Individually, he visited 26 police stations, analyzed the records, spoke with the police officer, junior and senior, spoke with the victims, spoke with the media, and after a great deal of research, 
he presented, we have this damning verdict for Sri Krishna Commission. He even gave suggestions how can we prevent these riots. But, you know, it takes time. By the time this happened, the government says bygones are bygones. Because they know if they implement the report, they are afraid that they will lose the vote bank. At that time, to appease the minority, they appointed the commission. How many commissions? I don't know. How many, I don't know how many commissions have been implemented. I think Justice Suresh can tell. How many commissions that they appoint have really been implemented in India? How many? So here we know it is a delaying tactics. The innocent Indians, especially the Muslim victims, we have faith in the judiciary system of India. <laughs> if the politicians betray us, if our other citizen fellow members betray us, if the police betrays us in this country, we have yet faith in the judiciary system. <laughs> and we know that finally, most of the innocent people, whether they are arrested, etc., they are finally released. But the damage done to them, it cannot be undone. Later on, we come to know, after a couple of months, on 12th of March, 1993, there was a series of 13 bomb blasts in Bombay, in which more than 250 innocent citizens of Bombay were killed. More than 250 innocent human beings were killed. And more than 700 human beings were injured. The opposition said, oh, planned everything. Just as Sri Krishna said, it was not meticulously planned, it was a retaliation. More than one and a half thousand innocent Muslims killed in riots in Bombay. More than one and a half thousand innocent Muslims during the Bombay riots of December 92 and January 93 were killed. It was a retaliation. And the authorities and the police said it was done by Muslim underworld with the help of some others. That's how the bomb blast took place. And they say, all of them agreed, even the police commissioner, they agreed that it was a retaliation to what had happened in Bombay. We know that immediately after the riots of December 92 and January 93, it was difficult for the Muslims to walk on the streets. It was difficult for him to travel in the train, travel in the bus, to work in a non-Muslim area. They were looked down upon, they were ridiculed. Immediately after 12th March 93 bomb blast, those scenario changes. Most of the Muslims, they know that killing innocent people is prohibited. Yet, they had a soft corner for these people who did the bomb blast. They were happy internally. In Islam, two wrongs don't make a right. Islam condemned this act. <laughs> killing innocent human being is to be condemned. You cannot kill innocent human being if somebody else has done injustice to you. You can't kill a third person even if you belong to the same community. Islam prohibits that. Whoever did it, whether Muslims or non-Muslims, whoever killed more than 250 innocent human beings on 12th March 1993, Islam condemns it. Most of the Muslims knew that killing innocent people is haram, it is prohibited, yet they were internally happy. But you cannot use wrong means to reach a right goal. You cannot. Islam does not permit that you use the wrong method to reach a right goal. There cannot be any justification. We realize that Muslims are harassed, they were tortured, they were killed, but you can't justify the killing of innocent human beings. Imagine the family of those more than 250 innocent human beings. When they come to know that the Muslims have killed us, they will think, what kind of religion is this? What wrong did they do? Did they harass you? The person who has harassed you, if you catch him and put him to trial and is the culprit and you punish him, no problem. All religions give you permission. The innocent people killed on the street. What wrong they did to you? Imagine he will become a permanent enemy of Islam. Islam does not justify the killing of any innocent human being. It is to be condemned. When we realize the chain of sequence of events, who is to be blamed? We come to know that prevention is better than cure. Who is to be blamed? When we see the sequence of events, we come to know that if the opposition politicians, the politician from the opposition party, if they would not have used Babri Masjid and Ram Janbhumi issue as a political plank, the Bombay bomb blast in 93 would have taken place. Later on, the politicians in power, they could have easily prevented the gathering. 
they could have easily prevented the destruction of the Babri Masjid. Easily. They had the Supreme Court verdict. They had the military, they had the police, but they were afraid that if we do it, we'll lose vote bank, so they let the destruction take place. Second people responsible are the politicians in power. Third people, the innocent Indians, they are instigated against the minority, and they involve in killing of thousands of innocent Muslims. They are too responsible, but they're innocent people. Fourth people responsible is the police. The police could have easily prevented the riots in Bombay or anywhere in India, easily. The normal civilians, we are military trained. We cannot fight with the police. It's easy. It's very easy for the police of any city, especially Bombay, to prevent the riots. Very easy. Preventing terrorist attacks is difficult. I'll come to it later on. But riots is very easy. Easy. But they didn't do it. Some were afraid. There were a few who went out of the way and help the innocent victims, but the majority were silent spectators. Some even were party to it. Some who were silent spectators, they were afraid that if we went again, the politician would have been transferred. They too are to be blamed. Fourth people to be blamed are the police. Fifth, last, but not the least, the people who committed this bomb blast. Islam does not give permission to use wrong means to reach the right goal. All five categories are to be equally blamed. If you want to stop terrorist attacks, go to the root cause. Stop the injustice. Stop the wrong done to a particular group of people, and terrorism will stop. <laughs> it is difficult for the police to stop the bomb blast. We know, we understand. It's not easy, it's difficult. But to stop the riots, very easy. Same case. You see most of the riots that took place in India, they have the same sequence, same people are involved, the details may differ. Same group of people involved. We have the other example of the Gujarat massacre that started on 27th of February 2002 and went on till March 2002. It was followed after the burning of a single coach of the Sabravati Express at Godhra on the 26th of February 2002. We know very well. It is nothing hidden. It's an open secret that this train, the bogey that was burned, according to forensic reports, according to circumstantial evidence, it says that the coach was burned from inside. <laughs> there are several evidences. But everything was planned. It was pre-planned. Muslims were instigated. There was a gathering. But they didn't kill. They didn't kill the innocent people. They say that 59 car sevaks were killed, yet it is to be doubted. Yes, there may be a few people that have been killed. Many people who were thought to be killed later on were found alive. So then they kept on changing the statement. So it was an inside job. Babri Masjid, inside job. 9-11, inside job. Godra, inside job. Main people to blame, they are the politicians. Then immediately, next day, from 27th of February 2002, no retaliation, pre-planned. It was a state-supervised massacre of the innocent Muslims in Gujarat. Nothing spontaneous, all pre-planned. And innocent citizens of Gujarat, they were instigated. They were given money, you can see evidence, to kill thousands of innocent Muslims. According to the state of Gujarat, 793 Muslims were killed and 253 Hindus were killed. But according to several human rights organizations, they said approximately two to two and a half thousand innocent human beings were killed. Almost all of them, they were Muslims. Other report says that more than 5,000 innocent Muslims were killed. There were thousands of Muslim women who were raped. There were tens of thousands of Muslims who were asked to leave the house. The houses were looted, they were burnt. There were tens and thousands of Muslims whose places of business, they were burnt. They were completely destroyed. The people killed in Gujarat massacre is far more the number than the 9-11. The loss of the people of Gujarat, if you add it, it is much more than the loss that took place on 9-11. Yet, according to George Bush, the people who did Gujarat massacre, they aren't terrorists. Only if you harm the Americans, then there's a problem. 
we know that there are tons of evidence, tons of evidence in form of literature, newspaper, booklets, we have the communism combat, you have videotapes, VCDs, DVDs, actual recordings of the culprits, the people responsible, yet no action taken. Even the judiciary system, I'm sorry to say, in Gujarat failed. I think they were pressurized by the politicians. So much so that the Supreme Court of India had to pass a remark against the High Court of Gujarat that they were biased. And the trials weren't correct. <laughs> I feel it was mainly the politicians. The Supreme Court of India, they passed a judgment against the High Court of Gujarat that what verdict they gave was wrong. And I feel maybe it was the politicians who may have used the power. And imagine what we find after a couple of months. We have the Akshardham temple massacre. Two people were caught. They were killed. They're said to be Muslims. And the authority said that these people killed so many people in the temple in revenge, in retaliation. And they said, that all this was nothing but retaliation. Islam does not justify that. They may have a logic. These people who did the attack, or the people who retaliated in other ways, they have a logic. They say that thousands of our family members were killed in front of eyes. Our mothers, our sisters have been raped in front of us. We have been looted. We know the person responsible is our neighbor, the person down the street. We meet him regularly, but when we see him, it reminds us of the torture. When they go to the law, the law does not support, so they take the law in the hand. I am not justifying this act. Islam doesn't permit you. They take the law in the hand, and they kill other innocent human beings. Islam does not justify that. They have a justification. They say, our mothers have been raped. We know the culprit. They are in front of us. No one is taking action, so they take the law in the hand. If you really find the culprit and book him, and if he's caught, if you can do that, and punish him, Islam justifies. You can't kill any other innocent human being. Islam does not justify that. You cannot use a wrong mean to come at the right goal. However much you may have sympathy for them, but the point to be noted Islamically, it is wrong. It's not justified. Killing innocent human beings. Imagine the hundreds of innocent human beings killed by these people in retaliation, they, in turn, become enemies of Islam. What wrong have they done? It is the same thing. The earlier people killed innocent Muslims. No, you kill innocent Hindus. It's not justified in Islam. If you can catch the culprit, book him, punish him, fine. But not any innocent human being. Later on, on the 11th of July, we have, in this year, 2006, we have a series of bomb blasts in the train. Seven bomb blasts in the span of 11 minutes, in which more than 200 innocent human beings were killed. More than 800 were injured. The police and the authorities, they say, this too was in retaliation to the thousands of Muslims killed in Gujarat. The authorities say it is the hand of the L.E.T., lashkar e -Toyba. If you look at the sequence of events, could this have been prevented? Easily. Who's responsible? Number one, those politicians who had planned the burning of the coach in the Sabarwani Express at Godhra. They are responsible. Number two, the people at the center, at the center government. They could have stopped it, but they belong to the same party. They didn't know anything. Number three, the innocent citizens of Gujarat. They were instigated against the Muslims and they fell in the trap, they too are responsible. Number four, the police of Gujarat could have easily prevented, they didn't do it. They are responsible. And we know from records that most of the places, it was done under the supervision of the police. If you see the commission report, they too are responsible. Number five, the judiciary system of Gujarat. They didn't take action. Number six, the people who retaliated in the wrong way. The people who did the bomb blast, Islam does not justify that. They too are equally responsible. All six categories of people are responsible. But if we can prevent the first category, the first few categories, surely you will not have these terrorist attacks. <laughs> and we know 
that in the past one month, thousands of Muslims have been harassed, mainly by the police. The police says it is mainly the Muslims who have done it. It is the hand of the L.E.T., Lashkar Taiba. I say, if you can really identify them, catch the people who are involved, we have no objection. But you can't harass thousands of innocent Muslims. Hundreds of them were rounded up. Hundreds of Muslims, they were detained for days and weeks together. As Justice Suraj said, that hundreds of them, they had been rounded up. Even their family was not informed. Imagine. And the thousands of innocent family members, they too have been harassed. We know about 22 to 25 so far have been officially arrested. All of them, 100%, none of them, not a single arrested case is directly linked with the train bomb blast of Bombay. All of them indirectly related to some other event. If you really catch the culprit, if you have proof, you have no objection. But at random picking up the Muslims, what signals are you sending? We know that about more than 300 innocent people were rounded up in Malvani. More than 300. For what? For interrogation. Any logical person will tell you that for interrogation, minimum, you at least require three or four policemen. If you want to do a proper interrogation, one policeman to threaten, one to have a soft approach, one to note down, maybe one to observe. At least three, if not four, minimum three for a proper interrogation. It takes minimum one or two hours. People, experts say four or five hours. I say minimum at least one or two hours. How many interrogation can you do? What is the manpower of the Malvani police station? What is the manpower? How many can they do in a day? 10, 20, 30, 40, how many? How many? What's the manpower? What's the force? Maximum 100, if you let it go. They round up more than 300 people, keep them waiting for the full day, then they take the telephone number and address and leave them. What signals are you sending? It is my request that the police should take the Muslims in confidence. Recently, after the bomb blast, there was a program organized by the non-Muslims. How we have Muslims have here on terrorism. Similar, there was a program organized by the non-Muslims on a similar topic. Topic was different, but the issue was the same by the non-Muslims. And the organizers had invited two ex-senior police officials from Bombay, ex. One of them comes and blames the madrasa of Pakistan, the reason for terrorist attacks here. Second one comes and blames the madrasas of India. In the speech, you tell them that they should have computers, English, no problem, I'm with you. But to say that the Indian madrasas are directly or indirectly, even remotely, associated with any form of terrorism in India is nothing but a blatant lie. <laughs> Unfortunately for that police officer, there was one of the senior advocates in the audience. After the talk, he went and told him that, can you even give me a single white paper, single proof that any madrasa in India has been proven to be associated with any terrorist act? He said, I don't know. <laughs> Imagine what statement is the senior police officer giving to non-Muslims? What message are you sending? The Hindus, in turn, will be against the madrasas. So making such irresponsible statements by senior police officers, say, I'm being careful, I'm not naming, why? Because I'm a responsible citizen. What signals are you sending? I don't know of any madrasa in India. See, they are the center of learning. Fine, we may disagree, we may want English there, we may want modernization. I speak with the people of Madrasa, I may have differences, have more education, fine. Have English, have computers, we agree. But to say that they're involved in terrorist activities, indirectly or directly, even remotely, is nothing but a blatant lie. So what is happening, what message are you giving? We know that hundreds of innocent Muslims are detained. Many were arrested. The police goes and does a search in the house. Then they find some books on jihad. Proof. <laughs> Proof that involved in terrorist attacks. <laughs> the Bombay media reported that these same books are being sold in the bookstores of Muhammad Ali Road for several years. If that was the case, why weren't these bookstores closed down? Same books. Jihad. I would like to tell that do you know the Quran too speaks about jihad. 
And almost all, every Muslim house has the Quran. Do you mean to say that you're going to arrest all the Muslims of Bombay? <laughs> what signals are you sending? I, being a student of comparative religion, I would like to say that if you read the Mahabharat, there are more verses of killing in Mahabharat than the Quran. If you have a competition, <laughs> Mahabharat has more verses of killing people than compared to the Quran. Bhagavad Gita is nothing but a guidance given by Sri Krishna to Arjun. Arjun says, how can I fight against my own cousins? If you read Bhagavad Gita, chapter number one, verse number 43, 44, 45, 46, he puts his arms on the battlefield and says, I would prefer dying unarmed rather than fight my cousins. Immediately, Bhagavad Gita, chapter number two, verse number two, Sri Krishna, he says, Arjun, how could you be an impotent? And he continues, time doesn't permit me, you can see my videotape. It says that it is a duty of the Kshatriya to fight. When we see in context, I being a student of comparative religion, I agree with all the verses of fighting in Bhagavad Gita and Mahabharat because I know the context. It's a fight between justice and injustice. It's a fight between truth and falsehood. And what Bhagavad Gita and Mahabharat say that if you have to fight against falsehood, against injustice, even if it be your cousins, no problem, family members, fight them. We are with it. That is what the Quran says. What my request is that even the police should know the religious teachings of the different citizens of India. And I always take opportunity, and in the past several years, I have spoken to several non-Muslim police officers, senior police officers in Bombay, in Bangalore, in various cities of India. I was even called a couple of years back to the National Police Academy in Hyderabad, where I addressed more than 100 IPS officers, high-ranking commissioners of police, DIG, IG, DG, the director general of the National Academy was there. And when I spoke, they were shocked. Most of the information I gave, they were shocked. You should know what is the teaching of different religions. Imagine if I pick up these verses of the Mahabharata and Bhagavad Gita and quote out of context, surely we can get rights here. We have to understand different religions. And by God's grace, alhamdulillah, I have spoken to police and military internationally. In UK, in USA, in Bahrain, in Saudi Arabia, in UAE. Alhamdulillah. And I love interacting, especially with the non-Muslim police. Giving them the right picture of Islam. Unfortunately, they get the information of Islam from the international media. I'll come to the media in the ending. So what we should say that we should have understanding. I've been told by several advocates, and as Justice Suresh also said, that hundreds of Muslims were picked up. They were detained. Some of them mentally tortured. Some of them physically tortured. The advocates told me that the clans, as Justice Suresh said, that they were tortured. Some of them were even made to sign on papers which didn't agree, even on blank papers. If you know who the culprits are, select a few, catch them if proven. If they have done it, they should be punished. We aren't against it. But to catch thousands of innocent Muslims, what signals are you sending? Imagine to catch 10 terrorists, you interrogate and harass a thousand innocent Muslims, irrespective of whether you catch those 10 terrorists or not, surely you are making 100 new terrorists. <laughs> Many non-Muslim senior police officers in different parts, in different cities of India, and one particular in Bombay, he told me, Zakir Bhai, Dr. Zakir Naik, I will only be happy if you give talk in Hindi and Urdu. Your talk should be heard by the masses. I didn't speak. Recently, a couple of years back, I started speaking. Many senior non-Muslim police officers in different parts of India, they tell me, they know that by God's grace, 10,000, 50,000, 100,000 people come for my talks. And when I went to Kashmir, because I was the official guest. I met the minister, power minister, chief minister. But at that time, the governor of Kashmir, Saxena, he wanted to meet me. My schedule was tight. Non-Muslim, I took out time. He wanted lunch, dinner, no time. I went for breakfast. Saxena, the governor of Kashmir, he happened to be an ex-military man. I forgot his post, some colonel or major or high post he was. And we discussed. He was caring for the people of Kashmir. Later on, he comes to Maharashtra, he comes to Bombay. He wants to meet me. He calls me to the Raj Bhavan, the governor's house. I go and meet there. He tells Dr. Zakir Naik, you know, the impact that you had in Kashmir, 
the people that follow you, we want you to come again. We want you to come on the television of Kashmir. We want to come on the radio. But what my question is, that do you think my talk will be effective? I know that there is not a single verse in the Quran which justifies the killing of innocent human beings. There is not a single saying, a hadith of the Prophet, that you can kill innocent human beings, even if they belong to the same community that does an injustice to you. I know that. I can speak. But imagine if thousands of innocent Muslims are being harassed. The police, they tell us that most probably it's a hand of the L.E.T., Lakshay Toiba. For sake of argument, I agree with it. And the police tells us that the local hand should be involved, otherwise the bomb blast can't take place. I agree with it. Imagine the Lashkar Tohiba if they're involved, if you interrogate a thousand innocent human beings, they'll get ready-made recruits. Ready-made. You torture them, ready-made recruits. Isn't the police helping the Lashkar Tohiba? I'm sorry, please don't get me wrong. I don't want them to misunderstand me, otherwise they'll come to arrest me also. <laughs> What signals are you sending? Imagine if I agree with you that your theory is correct, that lashkar e tohiba is involved and they want local hands. You should get the Muslims in confidence. You can't round up a thousand innocent Muslims. We know, we understand that getting the culprits is very difficult, especially because the bomb blast was done with precision, with accuracy. It was a mastermind, according to the police. We know it is difficult. We understand your case, but that doesn't mean in the name of interrogation, you pick up a few innocent people, we can understand. But thousands, what message are you sending? Do you think my lecture will be effective? Maybe I will be able to convince 2, 3%, 5%, not more than that. So we have to solve the problem. What is the root problem? And the police should get the confidence of the citizens. If that is not there, how will they be able to stop terrorism? And if you want respect, you should give respect. There were good policemen also. Many of my friends who are advocates and lawyers, they told me that there were good policemen who helped the people when they were harassed. Some of the policemen had a very good heart. They helped them, they supported them. But generally, oh, you have a beard. Why do you have a beard? Oh, you have trousers above the ankle. Why do you keep it? Wearing a cap as though it is mentioned in the rule book. A terrorist should have a beard, should have trousers above the ankle and a cap, then I would be number one terrorist. Even I have my trousers above the ankle, I'm wearing a cap and I have a beard. What signals are you sending? There should be a proper training, a proper understanding of the religion of Islam. That's what William, when he advised, he told the US government that you don't know Islam. George Bush doesn't know Islam at all. It was the article that came yesterday in the midday. He doesn't know. Unless you don't understand, how will you be able to solve the problem? I don't want the police to misunderstand me. When I tell the Muslims that killing innocent people is wrong, though many Muslims disagree with me, Quran condemns it. Our Prophet condemned it. Killing any innocent human being, you can't justify it. I have to speak the truth. At the same time, I even have to speak the truth to the police force. I hope they understand the situation. And according to Julio Ribeiro, he writes an article in Hindustan Times, I think it was the 9th of September. He says that more the unnecessary arrests that are made to get a breakthrough becomes more difficult proportionately. The more unnecessary people you arrest, the chances you get at the real culprit is more difficult. My request is that even the police should know the religious teachings of the different citizens of India. And I always take opportunity, and in the past several years, I have spoken to several non-Muslim police officers, senior police officers in Bombay, in Bangalore, in various cities of India. I was even called a couple of years back to the National Police Academy in Hyderabad, where I addressed more than 100 IPS officers, high-ranking commissioners of police, DIG, IG, DG, the director general of the National Academy was there. And when I spoke, they were shocked. Most of the information I gave, they were shocked. You should know what is the teaching of different religions. Imagine if I pick up these verses of the Mahabharata and Bhagavad Gita and quote out of context, surely we can get rights here. We have to understand different religions. And by God's grace, Alhamdulillah, I have spoken to police and military internationally. In UK, in USA, in Bahrain, in Saudi Arabia, in UAE. Alhamdulillah. And I love interacting, especially with the non-Muslim police. Giving them the right picture of Islam. 
Unfortunately, they get the information of Islam from the international media. I'll come to the media in the ending. So what we should say that we should have understanding. I've been told by several advocates, and as Justice Suresh also said, that hundreds of Muslims were picked up. They were detained. Some of them mentally tortured. Some of them physically tortured. The advocates told me that the clients, as Justice Suresh said, that they were tortured. Some of them were even made to sign on papers which didn't agree, even on blank papers. If you know who the culprits are, select a few, catch them if proven. If they have done it, they should be punished. We aren't against it. But to catch thousands of innocent Muslims, what signals are you sending? Imagine to catch 10 terrorists, you interrogate and harass a thousand innocent Muslims, irrespective whether you catch those 10 terrorists or not, surely you are making 100 new terrorists. Many non-Muslim senior police officers in different parts, in different cities of India, and one particular in Bombay, he told me, Zakir Bhai, talk to Zakir Naik, I will only be happy if you give talk in Hindi and Urdu. Your talk should be heard by the masses. I didn't speak. Recently, a couple of years back, I started speaking. Many senior non-Muslim police officers in different parts of India, they tell me, they know that by God's grace, 10,000, 50,000, 100,000 people come for my talks. And when I went to Kashmir, because I was the official guest, I met the minister, power minister, chief minister. But at that time, the governor of Kashmir, Saxena, he wanted to meet me. My schedule was tight. Non-Muslim, I took out time. He wanted lunch, dinner, no time, I went for breakfast. Saxena, the governor of Kashmir, he happened to be an ex-military man. I forgot his post, some colonel or major or high post he was. And we discussed. He was caring for the people of Kashmir. Later on, he comes to Maharashtra, he comes to Bombay. He wants to meet me. He calls me to the Raj Bhavan, the governor's house. I go and meet there. He tells Dr. Zakir Naik, you know, the impact that you had in Kashmir, the people that follow you, we want you to come again. We want you to come on the television of Kashmir. We want to come on the radio. But what my question is, that do you think my talk will be effective? I know that there is not a single verse in the Quran which justifies the killing of innocent human beings. There is not a single saying, a hadith of the Prophet, that you can kill innocent human being even if they belong to the same community that does an injustice to you. I know that. I can speak. But imagine if thousands of innocent Muslims are being harassed. The police, they tell us that most probably it's a hand of the L.E.T., Lakshya Toiba. For sake of argument, I agree with it. And the police tells us that the local hand should be involved, otherwise the bomb blast can't take place. I agree with it. Imagine the lashkar e if they're involved, if you interrogate a thousand innocent human beings, they'll get ready-made recruits. Ready-made. You torture them, ready-made recruits. Isn't the police helping the lashkar e I'm sorry, please don't get me wrong. I don't want them to misunderstand me, otherwise they'll come to arrest me also. <laughs> What signals are you sending? Imagine if I agree with you that your theory is correct, that Lashkar Tohiba is involved and they want local hands, you should get the Muslims in confidence. You can't round up a thousand innocent Muslims. We know, we understand that getting the culprits is very difficult, especially because the bomb blast was done with precision, with accuracy. It was a mastermind, according to the police. We know it is difficult. We understand your case, but that doesn't mean in the name of interrogation, you pick up a few innocent people, we can understand. But thousands, what message are you sending? Do you think my lecture will be effective? Maybe I will be able to convince two, three percent, five percent, not more than that. So we have to solve the problem. What is the root problem? And the police should get the confidence of the citizens. If that is not there, how will they be able to stop terrorism? And if you want respect, you should give respect. There were good policemen also. Many of my friends who are advocates and lawyers, they told me that there were good policemen who helped the people when they were harassed. Some of the policemen had a very good heart. They helped them, they supported them. But generally, oh, you have a beard. Why do you have a beard? Oh, you have trousers above the ankle. Why do you keep it? Wearing a cap, as though it is mentioned in the rule book, a terrorist should have a beard, should have trousers above the ankle, and a cap 
then I would be number one terrorist. Even I have my trousers above the ankle, I'm wearing a cap and I have a beard. What signals are you sending? There should be a proper training, a proper understanding of the religion of Islam. That's what William, when he advised, he told the US government that you don't know Islam. George Bush doesn't know Islam at all. It was the article that came yesterday in the midday. He doesn't know. Unless you don't understand, how will you be able to solve the problem? I don't want the police to misunderstand me. When I tell the Muslims that killing innocent people is wrong, though many Muslims disagree with me, Quran condemns it. Our prophet condemned it. Killing any innocent human being, you can't justify it. I have to speak the truth. At the same time, I even have to speak the truth to the police force. I hope they understand the situation. And according to Julio Ribeiro, he writes an article in Hindustan Times, I think it was the 9th of September, he says that more the unnecessary arrests that are made to get a breakthrough becomes more difficult proportionately. The more unnecessary people you arrest, the chances you get at the real culprit is more difficult. On the 2nd of September, 2006, there was a good gesture by the police commissioner of Bombay, A. N. Roy. He wrote a personal letter to a couple of hundred Muslim leaders saying that the investigation is unbiased, we aren't harassing the Muslims. I too received one of these letters. And he said that if there is any query, any questions, we can come and sit across the table. We can talk. It's a good gesture. The letter came recently, just maybe a week back. I only hope it is not a theoretical exercise of public relations. If it's practically implemented, that innocent Muslims should not be harassed. If you really want to get the confidence, you see to it that you get the confidence of the Muslims. And then only you will be really able to catch the culprits. And if you get the culprits, whoever they are, surely they have to be punished. We know the authorities, they tell us, that why majority Muslims have been picked up. And the argument given was that when we analyze that in Punjab terrorism, majority people arrested, they were sick. In Ulfa, in Assam, majority were Hindus. In Tamil Nadu LTT, they were Hindus. So, but naturally in Bombay, because, you know, we think it's linked with Pakistan Kashmir, it would be Muslims. I agree with you for sake of argument. If a terrorist attack is done in Punjab, the majority of people living in Punjab are sick. So if majority of Sikhs are arrested, it is logical. In Assam, majority are Hindus, so if Hindus are arrested, it is logical. In Tamil Nadu, majority of people living are Hindus, so Hindus are arrested, logical. In Bombay, are the majority of people living Muslims? The Muslims are in minority. So why are they being picked up in majority? If you think it's an act of Kashmir militant, if you have got accords, we have got no doubt with that. But do you mean to say the LTT can't come to Bombay? Do you mean to say Ulfa can't come to Bombay? Do you mean to say Sikh terrorists can't come to Bombay? You cannot say 100% this act has been Muslim. You can say high possibilities. And if you show proof, we are with you. What we are trying to tell you that identify the people who are responsible, catch them and punish them but not thousands of people, innocent Muslims being rounded up. We know there are several records. Just a couple of months back, according to the ATS of Maharashtra, 16 members were arrested from a hardcore Hindu organization. They were involved in three bomb blasts in mosques. Mahmoudi Mosque in Parbani, one of the mosques in Jalna, one in Puna, three. And recently on 6th of April, in one place, by mistake, a bomb detonates, by mistake. While they were making a bomb, it exploded. It killed four people and 11 were injured. When inquiries were made, many people belonged to the same hardcore Hindu organization. And they found there that the plan was that to attack the mosque in the guise of Sikh. You know, this took place in Nandit. Sikh, why? Because there was a rift going on between the Muslims and Sikh. A Sikh girl married a Muslim boy, so there was tension, so they wanted to get advantage. So they wanted to do an act in the guise of Sikh. There are cases we know that Hindus have attacked wearing caps and beards. So you can't say 100% Muslims are involved. Maybe high possibilities, I'm not saying no. Recently, a few days back, on Friday, 8th of September, four bomb blasts took place in Malaga. One outside one of the mosques, one outside a graveyard in which 
35 innocent Muslims were killed and more than 100 innocent Muslims were injured. Again, prime suspect, LAT. <laughs> Can be, but not prime. Imagine, it is a game plan. It's a no name game. If you go to America, it's Al Qaeda. Here it is LAT. According to an article that came in the DNA on the 6th of September, a person by the name of Joseph, he writes that the foreign experts, they tell that if you involve yourself too much in the blame game, you lose focus and the main culprits are never caught. You do a proper investigation. If really they're caught, they have to be punished. Irrespective whether the terrorists are Muslims or non-Muslims, whether they belong to Kashmir, whether to Pakistan, whether Ulfa, whether LTT, if they are proved to be involved in that, they should be punished. I am not here to support any terrorist act, not at all. But if you want to get to the bottom of it, you should know that this should be done meticulously. We should take the citizens in confidence. One of the other cause is the media. Mainly that media which is controlled by the politicians. We have to be careful of this. And this media, they can convert black to white, day to night, hero into a villain, villain into hero. And we see that very often. If you see my tapes, I've given very such examples. But in India, it's fortunate that the more popular media is not controlled by the politicians. And we find that this media really gave the true picture, whether it be the Gujarat rights, the Bombay rights in 93, or even today, the innocent Muslims are being harassed. The media, whether it be the newspaper, the news channels, they have really given a true picture of what's happening. Not 100%, sometimes they get involved in news which is sensational. So when they get the news without checking up, they give it. It's sensational, they give it. But as a whole, we have to agree, the media has been honest. I'm talking about non-Muslim media. I'm not talking about the Muslim media. And here we find that they were honest and they projected the real picture. But what we have to be careful is of the media which is controlled by the politicians. And as far as the judiciary system is concerned in India, the innocent citizen of India, especially the Muslim victims, we have faith in the Indian judiciary system. Though some people say that some are corrupt, they are blasphemed in the community, but as a whole, we know most of the judges, they are upright and they are honest. We only hope that these people are not influenced by the politicians. So far, I know most of the judges, they don't care much for the politicians. If once the politicians get hold of the judiciary system, then God save this country. Yet, we have faith in the judiciary system. And to conclude, we have to realize that since we know that the cause of terrorism is injustice, the cause of terrorism is wrongdoing to a particular group of people, this thing should be stopped. How can we stop? As I mentioned, number one, the politicians, they should be honest, they should be just. They should not go for the vote bank and do things which are wrong. Once they're honest and they're just, irrespective, they lose their seat. You see to it that terrorism will stop. Point number two, the innocent Indian citizens, they should not be integrated by the politicians and do wrong things and kill other innocent human beings. Point number three, the police, they should be upright. They should be just. If someone is being harmed, they should see to it that he's protected. They should not be ploy of the politicians. I know there are times that they can be transferred, but if every policeman in India is honest, the new policeman who stands for will also be honest. So what will the politician do? If 100% of the policemen, I'm not blaming all of them, please don't get me wrong. I know most of them honest, they want to do, but because they're under the pressure of the politicians, they're afraid that they'll be transferred, they'll be harassed. But if all the policemen get together and say, let's all of us be honest, if they transfer you, the new person coming will also be honest. So there itself, most of this trouble of injustice will stop. And last but not the least, people cannot take the law in their hand. They cannot kill other innocent human beings, even if they belong to the same community who has an injustice on you. If we take this and we see to it that injustice is stopped, then surely India will be a very good country. It is estimated that in the next, by 2020, India would be a superpower. If all the Hindus and Muslims, if we live together, if we love each other harmoniously, we may have our differences. The differences will be there. We live with our differences, but we love each other. 
and we live peacefully and harmoniously, again India will be a superpower. <laughs> and Mahatma Gandhi, he said that if India has to improve, it should be ruled by a dictator as honest and as upright as Hazrat Umar. May Allah be pleased with him. <laughs> Mahatma Gandhi, the father of a nation, he advised the best thing India can do is have a dictator like Hazrat Umar. May Allah be pleased with him, anhu. He was an honest person. When it came for justice, he did not see whether the Muslim or non-Muslim. For justice, he gave justice. Therefore, he got the title Al Farooq, the person who differentiated truth from falsehood. I started my talk by quoting a verse of the Quran from Surah Isra, chapter number 17, verse number 81, which says, Wakul jal haq al batil, inna la batil When truth is heard like in falsehood, falsehood perishes. For falsehood is by its nature bound to perish. I would like to end my talk by giving the quotation of Dr. Adam Pearson, who said that people who worry that one day nuclear weaponry will fall in the hands of the Arabs, they fail to realize that the Islamic bomb has already been dropped. It fell the day Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was born. Jazakallah, thank you for your appreciation of the talk. We wonder how awesome and corrective would be the question and answer session. We start the question and answer session quickly. May I point the rules? Your question should be on the topic. It should be brief and to the point, and only one question at a time may be asked. Five microphones have been provided in the auditorium. One on my left for the gents, one on my right for the gents, one in the rear for the ladies. On the first floor balcony, one more microphone, number four, for the gents. Those who would like to ask questions are kindly requested to line at one of the mics to put forward your question. Yes, the brother here can put forward his question. Microphone number two. Yes, brother. We will request you to ask quickly and briefly so we can cover more in the less time we have. Yes, brother. Assalamu alaikum, Dr. Zakir Naik. My name is Muhammad Arafat. I'm a student. You said in your talk, two wrongs does not make a right. A few months. We'll allow non Muslim the first preference, please. So, any non Muslim in the queue, they're most welcome. It's always a policy in our organization that we give first preference to our guest. If any non Muslim like to ask a question, they're most welcome. Any non Muslim, with the brothers and sisters, they're most welcome. The time is limited. So any non-Muslim would like to ask a question, they would be given the first chance. Any non-Muslim, yes, brother, most welcome. My name is Shyam, Shyam Sunar. I work in Marathi Mahanagar paper. I am a writer. I mean, I don't have a word from your words. What do I say? But I think that... Thank you. ...that the government of Hindu and Muslim is one to be one. I think that there is something to happen. I think that there is something to happen. I have done it. 10-12 years ago. But in your mind, I want to hear that in India, in the country, I was in the city, 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 the Hindu and Muslim, if there is a wrong feeling in their hearts, and that is also the right feeling, there is no doubt in the right feeling, so what do you think about it, that Hindu and Muslim people can come together from the community? Brother, that's a very good question. That what is the suggestion from me that how can we get the Hindus and Muslims on a common platform? How can we come together? The reply to this is, I have given a talk on similarities between Hinduism and Islam. I have given that talk in Bombay. I have given that talk in Chennai. I have given in other parts of India. And we find there that tens of thousands have attended in Bombay, about 20,000 in Chennai, a similar number, and other parts of India. And many non-Muslims have attended, many Hindus have attended, thousands of them, and many of them told me that Brother Zakir, there was a person, just a comment, that what I did not know about Hinduism in the past 40 years of my life, I have learned in the past four hours. I follow the guidance of the Quran of Surah Al-Imran, chapter 3, verse 64, which says, Ta'ala vila kalmitin sawa imbrana bainakum. Come to common terms as in us and you. Which is the first term? Allah na abda illallah. That we worship none but one God. What we realize that I don't believe in interfaith dialogue. We say that Hinduism is the same, Islam is the same, Christianity is the same. This is just a gimmick. If I ask the Hindu Pandit, will you become a Muslim? He'll say no. If I ask the Muslim, will you become a Christian? He'll say no. If I ask the priest, will you become a Hindu? He'll say no. So what is the same? 
It's not same. We have to agree that there are differences, but there are similarities also. Let us agree at least to follow the commonalities. What is different, keep it aside. So what I say, that take all the religious scriptures, whether it be the Bhagavad Gita, whether it be the Veda, the Upanishad, the Bible, the Quran, at least what is common, what is different, keep it aside, we can discuss some other time, but at least what is common, let us agree to follow it. And I've given the talk and I've showed so many similarities. So many. So you can refer to my video cassette. And what happens, many of them are not aware. The Muslims are not aware of their religion. Similarly, the Hindus are not aware of their religion. Many of the Muslims objected. Similarity between Islam and Hindu is impossible. So many of the people came with the talk to attack. The Rabbi, I'm bullying. What nonsense. Hindu and Muslim, same. Hoi nahi takta hai. But when they heard the talk, they were shocked. Those who came to attack, they agreed with the talk. Similarly, many Hindus came. So what we realize, that what is common we should follow. And number one is Allah na'abud illa, that we worship none but one God. That's the most common thing, and which you can give quotations. And we can give quotation from the Vedas, from the Bhagavad Gita. It is mentioned in the Chandogya Upanishad, chapter number six, section number two, verse number one. Ekkam evidityam, God is only one without a second. It's mentioned in the Shvetashitar Upanishad, chapter number six, verse number nine. Nacha se kasij, janita na chadipa. Of him, there are no lord, he has got no parents. These are Sanskrit quotations. That means Almighty God has got no parents, he has got no lord. Furthermore, if we analyze, it is mentioned in the Shvetashitar Upanishad, chapter number four, verse number 19. Nata masti, of that God, there are no images. There is no pratima, there is no photograph, there is no idol, there is no image. Same thing in Yajurved, chapter number 32, verse number 3, Natasipati Masti, of that God, there are no images. So if you go back to your Vedas and your religious scriptures, it speaks about one God. So people many a times are not aware of the scriptures. And when the question, just a couple of days back, I had given an interview to Star News. They asked me, Brother Zakir, what is your view regarding Mande Mataram? Can the Muslims say or not? I said, what do the Muslims say? I'll come to it afterwards. I'll first tell you what the Hindu scriptures say. <laughs> he was shocked. What do I mean by that? I said, if anyone who's a scholar of the Veda, the Veda agrees that God has got no pratima. So when you say Vande Mataram, that this country is my mother and you call it God, a person who's a scholar of the Veda, I'm not talking about the normal people who don't know about the scriptures. But you ask a scholar, he will say that Vande Matram goes against the Vedas. Because Vande Matram in no less than three places it says, I bow down to thee. I worship thee. If you see about the Arya Samaj and you see the various top scholars, they think that according to the Vedas, idol worship is not permitted. There are verses in Bhagavad Gita, chapter number 7, verse number 20, which says that you should not do idol worship. So here, when we go back to our scriptures, unfortunately, they believe in a form of pantheism. So even according to the Vedas, if you're a good scholar, this song, Vande Mataram, that I bow down and I worship thee, as I quoted in Sanskrit, about Upanishad, it's against. Even in Islam, there are 12 lines which are objectionable. Three times it is said, Vande Mataram, which means I bow down to thee. If once it says that this country is my mother, once it says I will kiss the feet, once it says about the divine things, about the smile, talking about divinity, it calls it Lakshmi, it is called Durga, all these things are objectionable. We Muslims, we love this country, but we will not bow down to anyone but to Almighty God. <laughs> even a mother, even a mother who has born in a womb for nine months, we love her, we respect her, but we will not bow down to our mother, to our own mother. The number one human being who we love and respect in the world after Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it is Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We will even not bow down to a prophet, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Is it required that we should sing this song, Mande Mataram? It is a political gimmick. Politicians, they thought they'd get the vote bank. They even made a gimmick on the date. You know, when it was written by Bankin Chand Chattopadhyay in 1876, it was published in 1882. Now, where is century come now? And where is 7 September? They made a mistake, the politician, political gimmick. <laughs> Furthermore, even a Muslim living in Saudi Arabia, he cannot bow down to his country, Saudi Arabia. Even a Muslim living in Pakistan cannot bow down to Pakistan. It is shirk. So to say that the Indian Muslims are not patriotic, it is our religion. Our creator, our God who has made this country is far superior. So we love this country. When required for the truth, we are willing to die for this country. But we will not bow down to anyone but Almighty God. 
We would prefer questions from non-Muslims first because we have a limited time. I think it would be fair to the occasion. And people who would like to ask questions on slip can kindly write on the slips and pass it on down the aisle. A non-Muslim brother? Uh, the question has been put forward by my non-Muslim friend. Okay, we'll allow that. Assalamu alaikum, sir. Myself, Saif, and I am a management student. Uh, the question is that, uh, do you think that uh, Muslim uh, feel insecurity, and that's why can we say that the terrorism is its outcome? Thank you, sir. Your comment, please. The brother has the question that, do Muslims feel insecure? And that is the reason terrorist acts are done. I told in my talk the main root cause of terrorism is injustice. It's not insecurity. Insecurity may be part of it, but the main cause is injustice. Injustice and something wrong done to a group of people. If you read an article that came yesterday on Sunday midday, on the eve of the 9-11, one of the very famous persons, name is William, he writes and he gives advice that the root cause is injustice and wrong done to a community. And he agrees with the Bombay authorities that there are possibilities that Kashmiris may have done bomb blasts in Bombay, but he says, what is the cause? According to him, the Kashmiris are unmilitant people. They are peace-loving people, so what has forced them to fight? And he gives his view, it is because of democracy which is forged. He says that, not me, it's not my comments. Person who is an expert, and he gives advice to people in the world. He says that the democracy is forged, it is manipulated, that's the reason what we find that they're fighting. Same in Palestine. They're fighting because the rights are taken away. So the main cause of terrorism is injustice done to a group or any wrong done. So to get their rights back, this gives rise to a fight, to a retaliation, which is called terrorism by people opposing it. Those who agree with it, they call good. For example, Bhagat Singh. He fought for the freedom of the country. By the British, he was called terrorist. We call him freedom fighter. So depending upon what is the background? Therefore, before you give a label of terrorist, therefore I said terrorism has got different meanings, has got different definitions. It changes because of geographical definition. It changes because of history. So the same person who's called a terrorist by British government, we Indians called him a freedom fighter. So like that, we have to find out the main cause is injustice done to a group of people. I'll ask a question from non-Muslim brother on the slip. It's Christopher Lobo asks, how can you prove that 9-11 was an inside job? Brother Lobo has asked that how can I prove 9-11 was an inside job? I've got the proofs, I can repeat the proof, it has been proven by other people. Just a few days back, there was an article that came in the newspaper that 75 professors of US, they say, they believe that 9-11 was an inside job. And in the article, it was mentioned, it came in Times of India, I think on the 7th of September. It says that 75 professors and scientists belonging to different universities from different parts of US, they believe that 9-11 was an inside job. And they say that there were some politicians in White House who have engineered the destruction of the Twin Towers. And they say the main reason was so that they could attack and they could have control of the oil-rich countries. Open secret, I told you. One of the professors by the name of Steve Jones, he says that we do not believe that 19 hijackers and a few men in the cave in Afghanistan could have done such a professional job alone. They could not have done it. We don't believe. And by God, we are going to come to the truth and we are going to expose. We don't believe in the theory of the government. They don't believe in the theory of the government. And he further goes on to say that we as being professors and scientists, we know that the steel beam of the Twin Towers, they couldn't have melted at the temperature at which the jet fuel was there. And there were systematic bomb explosions which caused this to come down. Otherwise, it cannot come down. There are many tapes. There are many books written against it. I happened to watch many of them. I even happened to watch the video recording of this Professor Steve Jones. And yesterday's paper, we got another news. Three days later, Professor Steve Jones sent on a paid leave. <laughs> Imagine, paid leave. There are many tapes. If you happen to watch one of the tapes by the name of Loose Change 9-11, it was done by a young American of 21 years old. He makes a one-hour documentary. There are many, many are there. 
This 9-11 documentary, it has collected clips from the various, of CNN, of Fox Channel, all the news clipping, he took interviews, etc., and made a one-hour documentary. And then he says that people who saw the airplane, they said it cannot be a passenger carrier. It looked like a military plane. It didn't have any windows. And when he shows the shooting, when it comes close to the tower, there's another firing done from the wings, which hits the twin tower before the plane. Then further he goes on to prove, he says that he had statements of the management, the construction company, which had constructed the twin towers. They said, it's impossible. The twin tower made to withstand storm, to withstand tornado. This plane cannot knock it down. And it cannot come down because the fuel burns at 1,000 degrees temperature. This, even for 2,000 degrees temperature, for hours, nothing will happen to it. 10 days later, he changes the statement and said, no, it's possible. Jet fuel can cause damage to the beams. Another professor who gave the statement, he didn't withdraw his statement back, so he was sacked. <laughs> Furthermore, what they did, that in the documentary they show that when the Twin Towers came down, like how you willfully get down any building. And he gave statistics that many buildings in New York, tall skyscrapers, 40 floors, 60 floors, they caught fire for many hours, but none of them came down. It is the first building in the history of USA it has come down that way. And he showed photographs that when building it deliberately brought down, how do they get down by the explosion? The same way it came down. There was systematic bomb blast, and people who went to rescue, whether it be the firemen, they were interviewed, they said that we were thinking that someone up was pressing the bomb button, and the bombs were going out, boom, boom, boom. So how the twin towers come down? They have given proof. Furthermore, they say, that all the proofs given by the government, they analyzed. They said 19 hijackers, some of them, they were trained as flying off the plane. They went to the university and they interviewed the professor. Do you think that this person can do such an act? Impossible. The way the plane took a turn, and I have personally spoken to senior pilots who have flown big Boeings and Airbuses for several years, they said it's impossible to take such a turn. And imagine just a new person of a few hundred of us takes a turn. What the experts say, it has to be a military plane. Furthermore, information given by the government, you know, phone calls were there. Phone calls. Phone calls said that they said the passenger in the plane, they claimed that they were hijacked. One of the phone calls was by a flight attendant. She says that buildings, water, my God, my God. She's been flying for 12 years. Hasn't seen buildings in New York? Another person, he says, Mom, this is Mark Bingham. Mom, can you hear me? We have been hijacked. Do you believe? The question to be asked, if I'm going to speak to my mom, I will say Zakir. I'll not say Zakir next speaking. He said I'm Mark Bingham. Mom, I'm Mark Bingham. If Mark has to speak to the mom, he will say I'm Mark. He will not say I'm Mark Bingham. <laughs> he gave systematic proofs. Do you speak to your mother telling your surname? So all the proofs, all the phones were taped down, and then he did a survey that can the mobile phone work at 32,000 feet. When a survey was done at 4,000 feet, the chances of mobile working is 0.4%. At 8,000 feet, it is 0.1%. And 32,000 feet, it is 0.006%. 0.006. There's no chance. And the documentary says that today, USA is spending millions of dollars to reach mobile at that height. In 2001, they did it. <laughs> then, there are many documentaries. Then the documentary says that there are black boxes. Every plane has got two black boxes. And the black boxes can withstand a temperature of 3,000 degrees centigrade for several hours. And in just 1,000 or 2,000 degrees, all the black boxes have been destroyed. He goes on systematically. And immediately, after a couple of weeks, Osama bin Laden, he gives an interview on the Ummah magazine. And he says that I am a Muslim, I will not lie. According to me, killing innocent women is prohibited, it is wrong. Killing innocent children is wrong. Killing any innocent human being is wrong, and Islam condemns it. Osama bin Laden giving an interview and saying that. A couple of days back, you get a video clipping from Al Jazeera. Osama bin Laden training, 9-11. Because 75 professors say it and inside job, now they manipulate, and after five years they're showing on the television. Why? So here we realize everything, it was inside job. And these 75 professors, they have promised, by God, we will come to the bottom of it. Regarding the second attack at Pentagon. At Pentagon, when the airplane crashed, there was no scraping on the grass. Nothing. Only a hole in the Pentagon. And the hole was only equal to the body of the plane. 
and we see a crater and they showed on the television but when the wings went the wings weren't seen outside neither were the window panes damaged of the pentagon if a plane body goes in and the wing stays out either the wing will remain outside or the window pane will damage the building was intact so how could only in the circumference of a body of a plane how can the wings go in as well as the tail I mean, it's fabricated the people who said that you know the plane went just 40 feet above my head today science tells us that if a boeing is flying at 40 feet above my head that car will fly away <laughs> An interview was taken of ex-military person. He said it sounded like a missile. It had to be a missile. The missile would make that hole. And there was no debris. There was debris, only a little bit debris. There was no part of the plane found there. There was only a small engine of a fighter plane found there. Even in the other place, they only find a crater. Time doesn't permit me. The amount of ample of evidence given there, even a fool will know that this was an inside job. But it doesn't convince George Bush. And what they say, the reason is only to attack Afghanistan, Iraq, and then Iran. They have been predicting that Iran is going to be attacked. They want to have control of the oil-rich countries. So this terrorist attack is for what? One is injustice. Second is for money. It's for power. And when any politician find that he's going to lose the vote, he creates a fear psychosis. Okay, you better elect me or the Muslims will get you and they elected. Same thing in Gujarat. A fear psychosis was created. If you don't elect us, the Muslims will kill you, and the government came back in power. So what we realized, that this was nothing but an inside job. And there are several tapes, and several VCDs available, 9-11, loose change, then Fahrenheit, many. And if you see all this, it is a blatant open secret that this attack on the Twin Towers was done by George Bush himself. The, the last question of the day. So my question is very, very, very much basic to you. Uh, I believe that, uh, as you said, terrorism is a fight against injustice, right? I also believe that terrorism is somehow a fight against the government of, by a common people. Kisi insan ke saath agar anyaay hota hai, tabhi wo jaake mazhab ke naam pe log ikatta karta hai, aur fir you know he tries to fight against whatever has happened to him. But what I believe is. एक इंसान एक नॉर्मल पर्सन यू नो इफ समबडी हम में से अगर कोई गुजरात में होता तो शायद हम भी वही करते जो उन्होंने किया मतलब और आप क्या कर सकते हैं आप पुलिस पे आपको भरोसा नहीं है जुडिशियल सिस्टम 10 साल लगा देगी तो एक नॉर्मल इंसान के पास कौन सा ऑप्शन बचता है अगर उसके साथ कुछ बुराई हो तो व्हाट वुड योर एडवाइस बी टू अ नॉर्मल मैन लाइक मी इफ समथिंग लाइक दिस हैपेंस टू मी व्हाट शुड वी डू आई एग्री विद यू व्हाट यू आर सेइंग इज दैट इफ इट हैपेंड विद यू और मी व्हेन वी सी आवर फैमिली मेंबर्स बीइंग किल्ड इन फ्रंट ऑफ अस आवर मदर्स एंड आवर सिस्टर्स बीइंग रेप our house is being what will you do and i agree that what you do the same thing a normal human being will do that that's normal unless you have so much faith in almighty god i do agree with you 99% human beings unless he's wearing bangles kalai pe chudiyan pehne to alag baat hai otherwise this is a normal reaction unless a person has faith in almighty god even i would want to do the same if i did not know my quran if i did not know from the quran it is wrong because if i kill the innocent human being i am behaving like the same person who caused problem injustice to me just because someone does injustice to me it does not justify me to kill other innocent human being just because somebody has robbed me i can't go and rob a third person if i catch that person responsible and book him and punish him that's a different case but i cannot kill any innocent human being based on the logic of the quran that it prohibits you from killing any innocent human being i because i know the quran i will not retaliate in that way i will try and get evidence i will try and convince the government if he goes scot free what i say that all those people responsible for these terrorist acts whether done in gujarat in bombay right whether the politicians whether the police whether the people who have killed whether the people who did the bomb blast even if they go scot free in this world on the day of judgment god will surely punish them so we as muslims believe as it mentioned in the quran in surah al imran chapter 3 verse 185 that kullu nafsin zaiqat al maut every soul shall have a taste of death but the final recompense on the day of judgment because we believe this life is the test for the year after we leave it if we cannot do something here we leave it for almighty god to do the justice and inshallah i'll be punished in the year after if we catch hitler today what punishment can you give him 6 million people in what punishment can you give him 
You can kill a month. What about the remaining 5 million, 9 lakhs, 99,999 people? Quran says in Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 56, that those who reject our signs, we shall put them in the hellfires. And as often as the skins are roasted, we shall give them fresh skin so that they shall feel the pain. Today, science tells us that there are pain receptors. So God tells that on the day of judgment, if the skins are roasted, we shall give them fresh skin so that they shall feel the pain. If God wants to incinerate Hitler, six million times we can do it. We can't do it here. So therefore, we leave it to the main justice. Main justice to God. We thank you all for being present here. We would have loved to put forward all your questions. Dr. Zakir would have not minded. There were questions like Islam was spread at the point of the sword, jihad and terrorism, and many others. Inshallah, at a future date, we would get to hear more from Dr. Zakir. Jazakallah khairan. We thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for making this program possible for all of us present here today. And we thank all our guests to have heard the program with so much interest and enthusiasm. Thank you very much. Jadakallah khair. Now we begin with the more interesting part of the program, that is the question answer session. Please pose one question at a time. May we have the first question? Sir, my name is Vasikar and I am a Christian. And we are told that the crusaders on the crusades were waging a holy war. I am a Christian, sir. I am a journalist. We were told that the crusaders on the crusades were waging a holy war. And now after seeing the films, we know how ter much terrorism they did to the innocent Muslims. And do. do you not think that uh, this religious terrorism started from these crusades? And it is in another way it continues against the Muslims through all these centuries. The big, now this terrorism seems to be in a, another phase and uh, why these Westerners are always after the Crusades continuing this uh, sort of thing against them? Uh, well, that's a very good question. He being a Christian, he says that he was told that the Crusades is a holy war and that's what I told you. The Orientalists use this word holy war for jihad, it was nothing but the usage of holy war was another name for crusade to see to it that everyone joins and think it's religious. And the brother being a journalist has rightly said that now we realize that these crusades were nothing but terrorizing the innocent Muslims. I didn't say anything about this in my talk because I came here to speak about the Islamic concept. I didn't touch on any religion, negative point of any religion, neither do I want to touch. It is just I said that all religion prescribe fighting to let peace prevail. That's what everyone does. I never touched on any religion. That's not what I've come here for. But if you ask me a question, I have to say, yes, you're right, brother, that the crusade did terrorize the innocent Muslims. And that's how it has continued. And now, the same thing what they do, they are now saying the same thing to the Muslims, which if you analyze, you see in the world around you. You see in the world around you that how many people are actually accepting it. Today, Islam is the fastest growing religion in the world. There may be stray incidences somewhere in the world. There are black sheep in every community. But you will not be able to point out as a whole that where in the world are people forcing other non-Muslims to accept Islam at the point of the sword. No way. In fact, they are getting harassed because they are Muslims. Now, this thing can only be solved if you go back, if you go back to the Bible. If you read the Bible, Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, he said, it's mentioned in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 5, verse number 40, 41, he says that if anyone strikes you on the right cheek, offer him the other. If anyone strikes you on the right cheek, offer him the other. If someone asks you to walk one mile, you walk with him twain. If someone asks for the shirt, you give him the cloak. So Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, a messenger of Almighty God, he shows us how peace should prevail. He says, love your neighbor. So if you analyze, if you go back to the scripture, I don't find any way where Jesus Christ, peace be upon himself, prescribed that you should harass the Muslims. So therefore I tell all the human beings that go back, the scripture which you consider to be the most holiest, whichever scripture you consider, at least go back to your scripture, as the Quran says in Surah Imran chapter 3 verse 64, Come to common terms as between us and you. Which is the first term? Allah, not the illallah. That we worship none but Allah. Hope that's the question. My name is Sile Raja. Assalamu alaikum. 
in the name of Allah, the most merciful and the most beneficent. The Prophet Muhammad, Rasulullah, let peace be upon him. Actually, I am a non-Muslim. My brother is Saifullah. Actually, he is standing the dais. Everyone can see him. He has embraced Islam in my family and he is having so much problem with the parents, actually. That is not my question now. Actually, I belong to the fraternity of law. I would just like to just make a suggestion that the non-Muslims can ask any question. In topic, out of the topic, this is the opportunity. They don't get the opportunity. I would not mind answering any question. If it's from non-Muslim, it will be my pleasure to answer any question in the topic, out of the topic, on religion, on any religion, it will be a pleasure. Yes, brother, most welcome to continue. Yeah. My question is basically for my friend. Actually, he is a disabled person. He is physically handicapped. He is asking whether there is any intention of the God or there is any verse or any sayings of the proper moment. What is the criteria for a God to create handicapped or disabled persons? That's it. And I think Mike will not be available after my asking the question. So, for the Islamic Information Center and Mr. Dr. Fatima Musafar and Dr. Zagin Naik, thanks for giving me this beautiful opportunity. Thank you. Well, that's a very good question. That why, what is the reason that Almighty God has created some people who are handicaps? Brother, the reason is given in the Quran in Surah Mulk, chapter number 67, verse number 2, which says, Allazi khalakal mawta wal hayata. It is Allah who has created death and life to test which of you is good in deeds. Now, this question posed by you, brother, that why were some people created handicapped, some poor, some people were defective, congenital heart disease? This question even troubled the philosophers of Hinduism. And that's the reason the Hindu philosophers, they came up with a philosophy known as samskara, the cycle of birth and rebirth. If you read in the Vedas, I'm a student of comparative religion, Veda speaks about Purna Janam. Purna means next, Janam means birth, next birth. Even the Quran speaks about life after death, but nowhere does the Vedas speak about life then death, life then death, life then death. There's no cycle. But because the Hindu philosophy is based on the logic, karma, every karma based on dharma, it has an action, has a reaction. So based on that, the Hindu philosophers came up with the philosophy that maybe in the previous birth, these people, they did some evil thing. That's the reason in this life they're born handicapped. Though this is not mentioned in any of the verses of the Vedas. Veda is supposed to be one of the most authentic scriptures of the Hindus. And you find nowhere in the Veda is mentioned. Only Purnajanam is mentioned, which means next life, which also the Christians believe, which even the Muslims believe. Because they could not give the reply why some people are born deaf, some people are born with heart disease. They came with a philosophy and a logic that human beings, they die, then they keep on changing forms. And if you did some bad deeds in the last life, in this life you are born handicapped. And they say that if a person does good deeds in next life, he'll be born on a higher level. And the best level of living creature is the human being. If you do bad deeds in this life, next life you may be born as a lower being, maybe as a cat or maybe as a dog, as a lower being. If you do good deeds as a higher being, I ask this question, that today crime in the world is increasing or decreasing? Increasing or decreasing? Increasing or decreasing? Increasing. increasing. Unanimous decision. Increasing. Today, the population of human beings in the world increasing or decreasing? Increasing. If I agree with the logic that good deeds make you an inferior being, then the population of human beings should decrease. <laughs> but yet the query, why some human beings are born handicapped, some poor, some congenital defect, the reply is given, as I said, in the Quran, in Surah Mulk, chapter 16, verse number 2, Allah khalakal mawta wal hayata. It's Allah who has created death and life to test which of you is good in deeds. This life you are leading in this world is a test for the hereafter. And based on the examination that is given to you, you will be judged. And Almighty God judges different people in different ways. See, when you appear for an examination, every year the examination paper keeps on differing. If you have the same paper, then where is the test? The paper should keep on changing. Similarly, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tests different people in different ways. Some people he gives wealth. If you give them wealth, the Islamic Sharia says, 
you have to give 2.5 percent of that excess wealth in charity. It is called as zakat. For a poor person, he doesn't have to give zakat. He gets 100 out of 100 in zakat. You know, the rich person is more difficult, as Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said. It is impossible for the rich person to go to paradise. And Prophet Muhammad said, it is difficult for a rich person to go to heaven. If we analyze that depending upon the facility Almighty God has given you, he will judge you accordingly. So if he's given you wealth, you have to give charity. If he has given no wealth, then you have to give no charity. Some people, he makes them born with congenital defects. They're born handicapped. So someone may ask me that, what is the fault of that young child? What sin did he do? We believe in Islam that every child is masoom. Every child is innocent. He's sinless. But when he's come in this life, maybe as Allah says in the Quran, the wealth and your children and your wives are a test for you. It may be a test for the parents. Almighty God may be wanting to test the parents. The parents may be very pious, maybe believing in God. No, God wants to test them with a more difficult examination. That now I make your children born handicapped. Then God wants to test, do you yet have faith in Almighty God? And more difficult the test, the higher is the reward. For example, if you want to appear for a simple BA graduation examination, the test is easy. To appear for an MBBS graduation examination, it is more difficult. But the moment you pass MBBS, in front of your name, you get doctor. Test is difficult, but the moment you pass, you get doctor. A more superior honor. So more difficult the test, higher is the reward. So Almighty God tells different people in different ways. Just because a person is handicapped, that does not mean that he did sin in his previous life. He's innocent. The handicapped person, maybe it's a test for his parents. Maybe it's a test for that person himself. That God wants to test him, that yet does he believe in the Creator or not? That's the reason some people he makes poor, to be born in a poor environment, some people rich environment, some people are born healthy, some people are born handicapped, and depending upon the examination he gives you. You know, when we have a 100 meters dash, there are some people who get handicapped. They start from a 50 meters mark. Because if a person who has slight defect in the leg, to make the race equal, he gets a 50 meters lead. If Almighty God, has seen to it that certain facilities have been taken away from certain human beings, his test will be accordingly. If the examination paper is difficult, the teacher corrects the paper leniently. If the examination paper is very easy, the teacher corrects the paper very strictly. So similarly, Almighty God has created different human beings in different ways, in different colors, in different languages, in different atmospheres. And depending upon the atmosphere they have been provided by Almighty God and the facility they have been given, they will be judged accordingly. Hope that answers the question. Uh, this is regarding the many books which were written against Islam, which led to the belief that uh, a lot of people worldwide, that our religion was wrong, the Quran was wrong, and our prophets were wrong. Among these people who believed in it, there were a lot of Christians who believe in the Bible too. And the Bible and the Quran have nearly the same prophets. We have Jesus Christ too, we have Moses too. So why today is the term terrorist used only in respect to Muslims? Yes, this is a good question that when Quran and Bible there are so many similarities, so why is this word specifically used in terms with Muslims? As I told my talk sister, this word fundamentalism initially was coined to describe a group of Christians in America in the early part of the 20th century when they objected to the church. So this word was coined for the Christians initially. The first time it was used in the English language. It was coined to describe the Christians. But today, as I told you, they have turned the tables over. So now they use it more to describe Muslims. Why it is the case regarding similarities, I have given the talk sister similarities between Islam and Christianity. Where I've described that there are various similarities between Islam and Christianity in the Quran and the Bible. So at least we as human beings, let us agree to follow these similarities. The differences we can talk later. But the reason that they are doing this, as I told you, because Islam today is the fastest growing religion in the world. The people may be fearing that if Islam grows, maybe what they call as pleasure, they may have to give it up. Good evening, sir. My name is Vasudha Tyagaraj and I'm a law student actually. 
Firstly, I would like to thank you for giving us such an informative talk on uh, terrorism and Islam. My question is, uh, what do you think is the reason for the sudden increase in the number of terrorist organizations which are basically Islamic and they fight in the name of Islam? And since you say that uh, Islam is giving the guidelines is that uh, women, children, elderly people shouldn't be injured or killed, uh, but there have been various bomb blasts and killings of women and children. What do you think is the reason for that? Thank you. The sister has asked a very relevant question, that what is the reason that there's increase in terrorist organization among the Muslims and so many bomb blasts, and especially when Islam says you should not kill children, etc., what is the reason? And that's a very good question. Personally, tell you again, that personally I haven't met and interviewed any so-called 100% hardcore terrorist, I haven't met. But I can give the reasons, the logical answers why such thing may be happening. Number one, some people may really be terrorizing the innocent people. Some Muslims may be on the wrong track. They may not be following the guidance of the Quran. Like you have black sheep in every community. One of the number one terrorists of human history, who it is? It is Hitler. He has incinerated six million Jews. So can I blame Christianity for that? Hitler was a Christian. So I can't say because Hitler incinerated six million Jews, therefore Christianity says that you have to. He alone, if you add up all the terrorist organizations put together, I doubt whether it'll reach six million. One individual alone. Again, Mussolini. Mussolini is a Christian. So just because Mussolini killed thousands of innocent people, that does not mean I can blame Christianity for that. So there may be certain black sheep in the community, black sheep, maybe calling themselves Muslims, and maybe in the wrong, maybe. Point number two. It can be that there are people who are harassed. Like you asked me, that today there is no Indian fighting for the freedom of the country. Do you find any Indian fighting for the freedom of the country? No. But 100 years back, there several. So if you ask me, Brother Zakir, why did 100 years back, there were many Indians fighting for the freedom? Because the British government ruled India. That's the reason people are fighting for their freedom. Today, the British government has gone back. So no one is fighting for the freedom. So maybe these Muslims may actually be harassed. They may be being harassed. And you find this in several parts of the world, in Palestine, etc. That you find that maybe if you go to the history, if you go back to the history and you find that they have really been harassed. And if no one is coming out to help them, they are resorting to whatever means they have. Like the example which is given in the Bible, David and Goliath. The stone was sufficient. So, who is to blame? We are to blame. We are to blame that we aren't going to the root cause of the problem. If there is a terrorist organization, we have to go and really find out what is the reason that they have resorted to terrorism. The only way you can solve this problem. Just by killing them, these terrorists, it will not solve the problem. If you kill one, there will be ten emerging. What we have to do, we have to go and find out what is the reason. Why are you resorting to this method? We have to go back to the root cause. It is like giving the example of Palestine. When Hitler incinerated six million Jews, the Jews were kicked out from Germany. And the Palestinians, they said, Ellen was Ellen, you are our cousins, come and join us. It is like I tell a stranger that if you have a problem, come and stay in my house. After a few years, he kicks me out of the house. And when I start making a noise outside my house, that see, these people have entered my house, so you call me a terrorist. Am I a terrorist? I was welcome a person with a stranger just as a human brother I got him to the house. After a few months he kicks me out and when I say that I want my house back, you say that I'm a terrorist. Who's to blame? We are to blame. We are to blame. We have to find out that what is the cause of the problem. If we, who Almighty God has given us intelligence, has given even the power and to get together, if we get to the root cause, you'll come to know that why should a person want to die? Who would like to die? Who would like to die? A person who says that I say I'm going to get killed, so why not I die and take somebody else also? So if you ask the psychologists, they will tell you the root cause is we have to go and ask these people that why are you doing all this? And many a time you'll find out that the truth is lying behind it. And the truth is that they may be being harassed and some people may really be terrorists. Some people may be terror and the people for money. Some people for fame, some people for politics. So I do agree, sister, that but majority what I feel that they are being troubled, whether it be Muslim, whether it be Hindu, whether it be Christians, there has to be a backlash if a person cannot bear 
whatever torture that he's undergoing, he resorts the psychologists say, and I'm a medical doctor, I've done my studies in medicine, they have to retaliate. It is human nature. So why should a person who would not like to raise a finger would like to carry a gun in the hand? Why? So what we have to do, we have to find the root cause and try and solve this problem. That's the only way we can see to it that these terrorizing, the innocent people will stop and all human beings can live together as one brotherhood. Yeah, myself is uh, Ravi Kumar. I'm a software engineer. And uh, my first request to my fellow Indians is don't always relate September 11 with the terrorism because so many things have happened in India. More than 20,000 people have been killed in Kashmir. 2,000 Muslim brothers have been killed in uh, Gujarat. So we have so many instances to link with terrorism in India itself. Like we can link uh, December 13 to the terrorism and the day in which Akshardham temple people have entered that we can link it with the terrorism. My, I thank uh, Mr. Jagir Nayak for clearing the misconception about the jihad. My question is that you told that uh, just for the sake of one person, you cannot uh, attack the country. Now, I am asking about the imaginary scenario. Suppose I am going to the, some Arab country, I am causing a great devastation, I am killing lakhs and crores of people there, and I am coming back to the India. And uh, the country is giving a proof to me, a proof to Indian government, stating that this person has caused the devastation. And the Indian government is repeatedly still, uh, telling that uh, proof what is given by you is not valid. And that proof is being shared with the other countries. They all agree. And suppose the country repeatedly is not ready to surrender me. Then what is the action that particular country has to take? Uh, let let just, uh, I have not completed. And another thing is the proof of that country is previously also when that kidnapped plane entered that, they encouraged the kidnappers, they allowed the terrorists who have come in that plane to escape out of the country. If that is the status of the country, then what is the action that particular country has to take it? You are telling, suppose I have come, after causing a devastation, I have come back to India, Indian government is not ready to surrender me. And the proofs have been given, and Indian government is repeatedly telling the proof what you have given is not valid. What is the action that country has to take? The brother has asked a very good question, and a very relevant question, a very good analogy between what's happened 11 September again, though he came back to 11 September. <laughs> analogy is very good, that he as a person goes and crosses an Arab country, kills thousands of people, devastation comes back, and the Arab country gives proof to the Indian government, Indian government does not accept. Mullah Omar again, he's not my friend. He told USA, he told USA, give me proof. And the USA government could not give proof. They shared it with Tony Blair. They shared with Musharraf. Musharraf is saying that I have got enough proof. I have seen the proof. When you're asking the Afghanistan government to give the culprit, the Afghanistan government is telling me, at least give us proof. And they could not give proof to Afghanistan government. And they're sharing it with Tony Blair. It is illogical. That means there's something fishy in the proof. Till today, till today, <laughs> till today, Osama bin Laden is prime suspect. It's only hypothesis. The proof should be solid proof. And if they had given solid proof that Osama bin Laden had done it, Afghanistan had to hand over Osama bin Laden. We didn't do. If you do something to the Arab country, and Arab country gives proof, and if Indian government objects, then you can go to the International Court of Law. Where is the International Court of Law taking place in case of Osama bin Laden? Where is it? Where is it? There are international guidelines. Do you know the rule of international guidelines? If, suppose, there is an extradition policy between the foreign countries. For example, if a person like India and UK have an extradition policy. If any criminal of India does a crime and goes to UK, they can ask for the criminal back. And one of the examples is Nadeem. You know Nadeem, the music director. The Indian government said that he was involved in Gulshan's murder. So when they gave the proof in UK government, in the UK court of law, the UK court of law said your proof is nonsense. They sued the government, Indian government. Indian government had to pay the charges 
of the advocates of Nadim. Enough proof they gave. They didn't agree. They said your proof is not valid. Did India wage a war against UK? Why didn't they wage a war? Why didn't they wage? But the Indian government gave proof at least. There, USA didn't give proof to Afghanistan at all. So even now, if you go to a Saudi land or any Arab land, and if you do something, and if Saudi Arabia gives proof here that you are the culprit, even if the Indian government doesn't agree, Saudi government or any Arab country cannot bombard the one billion Indians. It doesn't give permission. <laughs> Islam doesn't give permission that even if you are the culprit, even if you have killed one million people, they can come and catch you if they have the power. They can't bombard the innocent people. They can't. They can't do it. It's not allowed in Islam. Same thing you are saying, let's talk about the present scenario in Kashmir, in Gujarat, in Akshadam. I say that whatever may be the background, why those two terrorists entered. In Islam, you cannot destroy the monasteries. You cannot kill the religious people. If anyone goes in a monastery, in a place of worship, in a temple, and killing innocent people, it is against the Quran. It is against the Quran. We have to condemn it. Just because those two people, whatever the reason was, and they got a letter that they believe they came from Tahrik e Kisas. Kisas is an Arabic word, which means you can take revenge. And it said it was the cause was because maybe their family was killed. Even if their family was killed, they have no right to kill 44 people. <laughs> the cause was maybe somebody else, but the action was wrong. Just because somebody killed, if they knew who the person had killed their family members, if they have gone and taken revenge with that person, it was separate. How can they kill other 44 people who are innocent? So in Islam also, even if you know who the main culprit is, as I said in my talk in Surah Maida, chapter 5, verse 32, if anyone kills any other human being, unless it be for murder or for creating mischief in the land, it is as though he has killed the whole of humanity. Only if you know who the person is, if he has done mischief, and then murder, that is the only way that you can kill him. For no other reason can you kill anyone else. Islam condemns that as though you have killed the whole of humanity. Hope that's the question. Assalamu alaikum, brother. As a Muslim, personally, I want to ask you this question. In the current socio political, theological climate of stark black and white prevalent in the world today, I find it extremely difficult to endorse any faction or even my own notions of right and wrong. Ruling out the validity of the prejudice, it is an accepted norm today that it is the followers of the faith who reflect the faith itself. Assuming such an argument, how can I make a stand? How can I preserve the solidarity of my faith when there is a basic conflict of opinion between me and my Islamic peers? As an individual, would you personally endorse the stand of a Saddam Hussein, the passion of a Mujahideen fighter, or the death of a Palestinian suicide bomber? The sister asked the question that seeing the conflicting views and ideas, she doesn't know where she fits in. Who should she agree with? Who should she not agree with? What should she say? She's asking the question that, do I agree with what's happening, the Palestinian Mujahideens, what's happening about Saddam Hussein, etc. Sister, as I told you, many a time these issues are political. What I say, that everything has a hidden agenda and because I keep on traveling a lot, and again, right or wrong, Allah alam, I can't say this is the thing. But mainly the cause are a few selected people and the politicians. Again, the politicians. For political reasons, they make someone the scapegoat. And that's the reason they want to see to it that the ulterior motives have been solved. Me as a Muslim, if you ask me, that what should I say if someone asks me? I can only speak the truth. If someone has caused them harm, if someone has murdered them, etc., etc., in this way, if they retaliate, it's allowed. Otherwise, they cannot. You ask me what's happening about a particular individual case, Osama bin Laden or Saddam Hussein, I say, I don't know the background. I cannot give a fatwa. I can't give a verdict on them because I haven't interviewed them. For me to give my opinion, I have to interview them. So what I say, Allah, Allah, Allah knows best. Allah will not ask me on the day of judgment, is Osama bin Laden a terrorist or not? I will tell that if he has done wrong, if he has broken the guidelines of Quran and Sunnah, he's wrong. If he hasn't broken, he's good. 
that is not my basis to pass the examination. What I have to read? I have to read the Quran. I have to read the scripture. This question can be dealt with those who are experts who keep on traveling to Afghanistan, taking interview, etc. And we find such coming in the paper, etc. You as a Muslim, me as a Muslim, Allah will not, Almighty God will not ask us the question of dear judgment that do you agree Saddam Hussein is a terrorist or not? We have to say Allah alam. We don't know. Neither do we support them, neither do we condemn them. If there's solid proof of a particular person, of a particular Muslim who has done an act which is proven to be against the Quran, then we have to condemn him. But if there's no proof, which is substantial proof, we have to remain neutral. That's what Quran says. And your faith has to shake, sister. Your faith should be based on the truth which is mentioned in the scripture. The best way to see to it that the faith is reinforced is to read the Quran. You will not find any defect in the Quran. You will not find any contradiction in the Quran. If a person doesn't understand Arabic as a language, you have to read the translation of this book. This is the translation by Abdullah Yusuf Ali and the translation is available outside in the foyer. That sister, if you read how to lead a life based on the Quran, inshallah, faith will become strong. And believe me, you will not feel shy at all to practice any of the fundamentals of Islam if you know the reason and logic why these fundamentals have been prescribed. If you know that, believe me, I keep on traveling in different parts of the world. I mean, I speak, I go with this cap, I have a beard, I go to different Western countries, never have I faced a problem. Sometimes query, inquiry is there, but never is a problem. I mean, why should I get scared to speak the truth? So if you have knowledge of the scripture and you know the reason and logic, you will feel proud. Even you too will call yourself like me. You will also call yourself a Muslim fundamentalist. Assalamu alaikum. I am Muhammad Fazlur Rahman Abdullah. Uh, sir, we are still on this 11th September. I want to say something on this. That as you told that, uh, as you told that there is something fishy in the proof. That's why they didn't prove, uh, put the proof. I got this fish on the net. Uh, there is a site in the ININ.com, ININ.net that have been banned actually. But I got one page in that, that there were two pictures displayed on that. One was the actor who acted as Osama bin Laden in the film displayed to all. Another was Osama bin Laden. And the title was, any fool with two eyes can see easily that these two persons are not same. That are the proof. Well, America put it before that. Another thing, my question is that uh, I was, I'm working in HL. We are given a handbook which contains do's and don'ts. On the top page of the handbook, there's written uh, Bhagavad Gita Shlok. A part of the Bhagavad Gita Shlok, I'll recite the whole shlok, like Yada Yada Hi Dharmasya, Glanir Bhavati Bharata, Abhyuddhanam Adharmasya, Tadatmanam Sujamiham, Pritranaya Sadhunam, Binashaya Chatuskrita, Dharmasan Sthapanar Thaya Shambhavam Yuge Yuge. They have especially mentioned it that Pritranaya Sadhunam, Binashaya Chatuskrita. If you have to, if you have to protect the truth or the good, you have to remove the bad. There's no other way. Okay. After that, I, I want that, that last of the, that uh, uh, slok is that dharma san sthapna artha hai shambhavam yuge yuge. It means that mein har jug mein shambhav hota. Bhagawan kehte hai, mein har jug mein shambhav hota hu. But what our belief is, our Hindu brother's belief is that mein har jug mein aata hu. I want Mr. Jaki Nayak to explain this. Are uh, this belief of uh, we are having is correct or not? Thank you. I request again from the audience and the volunteers, we prefer questions from non-Muslims so that let's clarify their misconception and then come to the Muslims. They may be attending several programs as such. I normally prefer giving a chance to the non-Muslim. They may not be having this chance regularly to ask any question on Islam. The brother has posed a question before that. He made a comment that there was a fish on the net and he saw that one proof was authentic and the original Osama bin Laden was false. Again, this fish could also be fishy. <laughs> so I'm not going to be one-sided. Ah, that proof you got is correct. Even that could be cooked up by somebody who's an enemy of America. So I don't believe on that fish also. So see, I have to be neutral. I cannot be biased and start judging, saying, ah, brother, you are right. You know the proof they gave. Well, that also could have been cooked up. That's what we have in Telka, you know, Telka. Telka, the audio cassettes and video cassettes. So all this is a gimmick of media. See, I am a man of the media. We know if we want, we can change. Very easy. 
To change something on the media is very easy. I can make you say what you have not said also. That's a field. So it's very easy. So let's keep the media aside. Again, that also I don't agree what is right or wrong. Allah alam. There's no proof at all. Now coming to your question. What the brother quoted is the shlok from Bhagavad Gita chapter number 4. What the brother quoted, he didn't give the quotation. It's from Bhagavad chapter number 4. That whenever there's adharm, there's untruth, there is violence, there's anarchy in the world. Almighty God, he comes and he takes the form of avatar and he sees to it that this, whatever anarchy, whatever trouble, whatever chaos is there in the world, he comes to finish that thing by taking the form of avatar. Is it right? Do we agree? The difference what we say as Muslims, what we Muslims say, that Almighty God, he sends his messenger. Whenever people deviate from the truth, he keeps on sending messengers, as Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Rod, chapter number 13, verse number 7, Wali kulli min had. And to every nation have we sent a messenger, a guide. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Fatih, chapter 35, verse number 24, well, in min ummatin nazir. There is not a nation or a tribe to whom we have not sent a warner or a guide. What we say that Almighty God sent messengers, like Adam, Moses, Jesus, Muhammad, peace be upon them all, all of them were messengers of Almighty God. The Hindus believe in the avatar, Almighty God, he takes forms. We say messengers, they say Almighty God takes forms. That's the difference. The difference is they say Almighty God comes down himself in taking form, which we disagree, which Christianity disagrees, Islam disagrees. What we agree is somewhat similar, though it's a difference of chalk and cheese, but what we say Almighty God sends messengers. These are chosen people of Almighty God to guide the people to the truth. And the last and final messenger that came on the face of the earth was Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And Allah has sent several revelations. Several revelations by name four are mentioned. If you have something like the Old Testament, something like the New Testament, we Muslims say this is the last testament. This is the last testament of Almighty God. Uh, good evening, sir. My name is Raj Kumar. I'm doing my final MBBS in Stanley Medical College. Uh, my question is, why do Muslims in India constantly oppose a common civil procedure code? Why do mis Muslims in India oppose a common civil procedure code? Thank you, sir. Your brother has asked a very good question. That why do Muslims oppose the common civil code? Brother, I am for the common civil code. But that common civil code should be the best code which practically gets result. I am for it. Even if the full Muslims of India are against it, I, Dr. Zakir Naik, is for it and I would debate, I would be on the platform to discuss logically which is the best code, which is the best law. And you find this, that the law which is the most practical law, you implement that, I would advocate that let India have a common civil code. Common criminal code also, why only civil code? Have common civil code, common criminal code, but we should have a dialogue that which is the best code. Like a Hindu lady who asked me that why does Islam allow a man to have more than one wife? I gave the answer. People appreciated it. So if you agree with the answer, you'll have to write a common civil code that man is allowed to have more than one wife. There is no other answer for the surplus number of women in the world. There is no other solution. No religion has that solution, though all the religions, there is no religion will say that marry only one, except for the Quran. And I gave an analogy that for hijab, for rape, I give the analogy that the best punishment that you can give, the best punishment you can give, which has the best result, as Islam says, the woman should be dressed up in hijab, the man, whenever he looks at a woman, he should lower his gaze. And after that, if any man rapes a woman, he gets capital punishment, there's death penalty. And I gave the stats of America that according to the FBI report in 1990, 1,756 cases of rape took place every day in the year 1990. In 1996, according to the statistics of US Department of Justice, 2,713 cases of rape took place every day in the year 1996. That means every 32 seconds, one rape is taking place. You know, we are here since the past two hours. More than 200 rapes have taken place in USA from the time we are here. 
I say that if you implement the Islamic Sharia, that every man when he looks at a woman, he should lower his gaze. Every woman should wear the Islamic hijab, complete body covered except the face and the hands up to the wrist. After that, if any man rapes, he gets capital punishment. I'm asking you the question, will the rate of rape increase? Will it remain the same or will it decrease? It will decrease the practical law and this you can see, there was a program on BBC talking about a part of Nigeria which implemented the Islamic Sharia and they gave the death penalty for rape and immediately the cases of rape came down. The least rate of rape in any part of the world is in Saudi Arabia. I am not speaking in favor of Saudi Arabia. But what is right we have to appreciate. And I congratulate LK Advani. I remember a couple of years back in the 1999, in the month of October, he gave a statement being the Home Minister that death rap should be given to the rapist. And I congratulate him. He is coming closer to Islam. Maybe the next Home Minister will say that all the women should wear hijab. Hello, Assalamu alaikum. I'm, my name is Yashar Payami. I'm from Iran, really. And I want to know exactly is that you must have read Salman Rushdie's Satanic Verses. And as a Muslim, I, nobody would have liked that book. So what do you think Imam Khomeini did was, what he did was correct asking for the people for fatwa. That was my main point. What Imam Khomeini had told about the fatwa, that, uh, against, fatwa against Salman Rushdie, was it correct or what? But there was the question that what Imam Khomeini said regarding the fatwa of Salman Rushdie is it right or wrong? My basic question is that why did Imam Khomeini give the fatwa one year later? The first country to ban the book of Salman Rushdie's Satanic Verses was India. And I congratulated Rajiv Gandhi for doing that act. Why should Khomeini give the fatwa of killing Salman Rushdie after one year? Because he was getting out of the news. All politicians. Politicians, if you wanted to give the fatwa, you should have given. The book was reviewed by so many parts of the world, so many countries banned it, and then he gives the fatwa, he should be killed. Whether right or wrong is afterwards, all the political gains. All political gains. All these things are political gains. But what Rajiv Gandhi did, maybe he didn't know about it, and I've given a talk on this issue of satanic verses. Though this book is banned in India, I've read that book. You know, Salman Rushdie, who claims that for namesake is a Muslim. He did not leave anyone. In his book, he even abuses Queen Elizabeth. And the same British government who had banned an American author for using a four-letter word, father, uncle, cousin, king, for the policy of Margaret Thatcher, that same Salman Rushdie, he makes it active and use ing. And yet the book is very popular. So one American author they banned because he uses a four-letter word for Margaret Thatcher. This another person, Salman Rajdi, makes it active, ING, for the same Margaret Thatcher's policy, but he gets an award. Why? Because he's maligning Islam, so they're very happy. And do you know, he even did not leave Ram and Sita, you know, these people are respected by the majority of the Indians. He even abused them. I don't want to use that word. He abused them also, he don't leave them. And many of the people are supporting. So maybe Rajiv Gandhi didn't know. But later on, if you read that book, you realize he did not leave anyone. So if a person who keeps on maligning, etc., Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 33, as to anyone who wages a war against Allah and his messenger, there are various options given, that you can either execute him, you can crucify him, chop off opposite limbs, or take him out of the country. And this law is not only in the Quran, it is even in the Bible. If you read the book of Leviticus, it says that anyone who blasphemes the law, you should stone that person to death. Even a passerby who is a stranger should stone that person to death who blasphemes the law. So this law is then all the religious scripture is not only there in Islam, in most of the religious scripture for blasphemy, whether it be Christianity, whether it be Islam, whether it be Judaism, for blasphemy, if it's a confirmed blasphemy, if it's that part of the country. We cannot give fatwas here. They should kill him, etc. If it's an Islamic state of law, if anyone blasphemes, there are certain laws and rules and regulations laid down. But what politicians do, whether it be a Muslim politician or whether it be a non-Muslim politician, I'm sorry, I don't again want to hurt any politicians per se. If not all, I say majority. You find somewhere or the other they compromise for their own World Bank. And that's the reason that it is said that religion and politics that you pose apart, they use religion as a plank 
to see to it that they get fame, etc. And that's what people do, which we people should be aware that the fatwa given by Khomeini, it was just a political gimmick according to me. But banning the book, what Rajiv Gandhi did, was perfect. He banned it, he was the first. And now they're thinking of removing the ban. I don't know whether the ban has come out or not. There's another statement that they're trying to remove the ban. But if anyone blasphemed the Lord in Islam, in Christianity, that person according to Christianity should be stoned to death. In Islam, there are four options. You can even exile him. Christianity, no option. Christianity, only stoning to death. In Islam, there are four options you can choose. In Christianity, you have to stone that person to death. Hope that answers the question. Good evening, sir. I'm T.A. Anuragni. I'm a final law student. The, I believe that terrorism could be stopped by, uh, at least could be reduced, when people are taught about tolerance. Does Islam preach about tolerance? And if, if it does, do people who are in charge of imparting Islam, I mean, uh, I believe uh, there are a lot of, uh, I don't know the exact term, terminology, there are uh, gurus like in Hinduism who teach Islam to the other uh, um, Muslims. So in that case, do they, do they impart, uh, preach tolerism? The sister asked a good question, and she rightly says that terrorism can be curbed by teaching tolerance, and does Islam teach tolerance? Do the religious leaders of Islam, do they teach tolerance? Sister, I said in my talk, which I said a bit fast, I didn't pay emphasis on it, one of the criteria for any human being to go to Jannah, to go to heaven, to go to paradise, is tolerance. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Al-Asr, chapter number 103, verse number 1 to 3, Wal Asr, Inna al-insan fi khusr. By the token of time, man is verily in a state of loss, except those who have faith, those who have righteous deed, those who exhort people to truth, that is to dawah, and those who exhort people to patience and perseverance. Tolerance is one of the criteria to go to Jannah. If you are not tolerant, according to Surah Al-Asr, you shall not go to Jannah. Not only should you be tolerant, you should even exhort people towards tolerance. But tolerance, by definition, it has got various meanings. And if you ask experts, that tolerance also has a limit. What do you mean by tolerance? Fine, someone does something wrong to you, you do not retaliate, it's good. Till how long? So tolerance also has a limit. And in Islam, Zalim is a person who does zulm, means you could say that a person who causes harm. There are two types of zulm. One is a person who does harm to the others, and another is a person who does harm to himself. There are two types of zalim, and both are referred as zalim. One who does zulm on others, another type who does zulm on himself. Our beloved Prophet Muhammad Wasallam said, it's mentioned in the hadith of Sai Muslim, if you see anything which is wrong going on, if you can, you should stop it with your hand. If you cannot stop it with the hand, stop it with your mouth, with your tongue. If you cannot stop it with the tongue, at least curse in your heart that the act is wrong. And if you do that, you are the lowest level of believer. The lowest level. So what we have to do, that we have to be tolerant. Teach tolerance, as Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Baqarah, chapter 2, verse 153, in the Allah sabreen. That verily, Allah is with those who do sabr. But while doing sabr, we should see to it that does not go beyond limit. Sabr also has a limitation. Tolerance has a limitation. So before it goes over limit, if you see that a woman is being raped, you can't tell the woman, tolerate it, no problem. If God has given me strength, if I see a man raping a woman, I should stop it with my hand. If I cannot do it, man, it is tell Arab Aisa, please don't rape. In Bombay, an article, a young girl, 13 years girl, she was raped by a man and there were five passengers. Only one person objected and he was kept quiet. Five people could over that man who was drunkard, who was drunk, and they did not do anything. What's happened to the humanity? What has happened to humanity? Five young people cannot take care of one drunkard, raping a girl in a train. Will you call this tolerance? I would call it cowardice. Therefore, I say that if these five people were terrorists, terrorists in the sense, terrorizing the antisocial element, that person would have the guts to do it. 
So what sister, we have to encourage and see to it that tolerance level of every human being is increased. At the same time, they should not become cowards. They should see to it that the anti-social element in the society, they are reduced and we should collectively gather together and see to it that these people who are anti-social people, they are brought to task. Hope that answers the question. Hello, my name is B. Deepak. I'm a chartered accountant. I would like to ask a question to you, sir, regarding the, the erstwhile Taliban regime issued a fatwa for the destruction of Bami and Buddhas, terming it as un-Islamic. I would like to know whether it is really un-Islamic and if it is one of the footsteps which the Satan has laid and the Muslims should be aware of. Brother asked me the question, the same question was asked to me in Surat when I was giving a lecture talk in Surat. Just a couple of days after this issue, it was very hot in the oven. The Taliban had, were destroying rather at that time the statue of Buddha Bamiyan. The brother asked me the question that, is it Islamic, etc. And the same question asked by a non-Muslim to me in Surat, that is it right or is it wrong? At that time yet there were conflicting views whether they were destroying or not. So again I said at that time that I don't know whether they destroyed or not, but today we know there are confirmed news that they have destroyed it, whether right or wrong. What I can say, what I can say, that I being a student of comparative religion, whether right or wrong, I'll tell afterwards, what I can tell that surely the Taliban's, if they destroyed the statue of Buddha, what they were doing is actually they were educating the Buddhists. I am a student of comparative religion. I have read the Buddhist scriptures. I have read Dhammapad. I have read the scriptures. No way in any of the Buddhist scriptures did Buddha ever say, make a statue of myself. Buddha never said that the Buddha should do idol worship. It is a later innovation. So what I could say as a student of comparative religion, whether right or wrong will come afterwards, what they were doing is surely they were educating the Buddhists. And in none of the Buddhist scripture is it mentioned that they should make a statue. Coming to the question. And this question was asked to me even by the press when I was in Bangalore. That just because Islam feels idol worship is not allowed, there are other religions, there's even Christianity. If you read the Old Testament, it's mentioned in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter number 5, verse number 7 and 9, as well as the book of Exodus, chapter number 20, verse number 3 to 5. It says, Thou shall have no other image besides me. Thou shall not make any graven image of me, of any likeness of anything in the heaven above, in the earth beneath, or in the water above the earth. Thou shalt not bow down to them, nor serve them, for I, thy God, thy Lord, is a jealous God. So even according to Christianity, according to Judaism, making images of anyone who you say is God is prohibited. Same it is prohibited in Islam. So when I gave this reply that they were educating the Buddhists, so what they said, that but didn't these Taliban's didn't they cause grief to millions of Buddhists? I said yes. So does Islam allow anyone to cause grief to millions of human beings? I asked the journalist a question. That what if suppose the Indian government catches a haul of drugs, cocaine, brown sugar worth 10 crore rupees? Worth about 2 million dollars, they catch a haul. Drugs. What will the Indian government do? So the journalist told me the Indian government will burn the drugs. I said, good. I said, do you know, for millions of human beings in the world, drug is God for them? So will you agree with the Indian government or go against the government that they're destroying the God of millions of drug addicts? Because the Indian government feels that the drug will cause loss to the body, what they're doing is right, even though it's causing grief to millions of drug addicts. But if they feel it is wrong, they're burning. You cannot go and tell the Indian government that why are you burning the drugs? A drug addict will feel bad. So similarly, Afghanistan is their government. It is their property. See, the statue is their property. If they come and do something in any other country, then you can object. They are doing in their country, it is their property. If they like it, they'll keep it. If they want to destroy it, they'll destroy it. Who are we to object? We can't object. And furthermore, if you analyze that people who talk, there was a person who said that Indian government is so tolerant. Do you know in Bombay, when you come out of the domestic airport, of the Santa Cruz airport, there was a big statue of Mahavi, of Mahavi, just outside the hotel Jal, and it was unclothed, so the people took objection. 
and then they build a wall in front of the private parts. Later on, after a few months, they remove the statue. Now, those same people who objected to the statue being there, those same people today are condemning Afghanistan. Why? The same people who objected to the statue being on the road. See, and do you know there are more Jains in India than Buddhists in Afghanistan? So when the government of Bombay could remove the statue which is believed to be God or believed to be the Tirthankas of the Jains and there are more Jains living in India than Buddhists live in Afghanistan, at that time no one objected. And now when the Afghanistan government is doing your objecting, why these double policies? You know why? Because of the World Bank. <laughs> Won't the Jain feel bad? So if the Jain believes in keeping a statue of Mahavir, who's a Tritanka, why are we objecting? At that time, everyone objected, the statue should be removed, statue should be removed, and the same people who objected were condemning that why did you destroy the Bamiyan Buddha statue? Double policies. Therefore, we as logical people should have a single policy. We should not be two-faced jammed in where we keep on changing the rules. So what I feel, that it is their property, suppose, suppose a non-Muslim, he buys a house. In the house, there is a carving of Kaaba. Suppose, is there is there. If that non-Muslim does not like Kaaba and he defaces the Kaaba, how can I object? If someone, you know, and believe me, if, if any Muslim, if any Muslim, if he makes a statue of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and if you disturb the statue, even if the full Muslim world is against you, I, Dr. Zakir Naik, will support you. Because making a statue of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is prohibited. If any Muslim lunatic, makes the statue of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and he worships it. And if you, being a non-Muslim, knowing knowledge of Islam, if you go and destroy the statue, even if the full Muslim world is against you, I, Dr. Zakir Naik, will support you. Uh, Mr. Jagir Naik, uh, what does uh, Islam say about the defaming of the other religion or other religious gods? Why I'm asking this question is that uh, when uh, one of the Indian artists who is uh, a Muslim, he has drawn a Hindu god Saraswati in a nude condition, which was appreciated by everybody as a freedom of expression. And each and every Indian supported when Salman Rushdie has written one book about the Islam, and when it was banned by Rajiv Gandhi, almost each and every Indian has supported that move. But when Hussein has drawn the Hindu god in a nude condition, Indian political parties, especially the parties like a communist, have told that uh, it is a freedom of expression, he can draw anything. But uh, what is the Islam's view on that, about the defaming the gods of the other religion? The brother is referring to the Muslim artist F.M. Hussein. He didn't give the name, or maybe he doesn't know, maybe he knows, he didn't want to give the name. F.M. Hussein, he's from Bombay, from the city where I come. He did some paintings of God Saraswati, unclothed, and many of the journalists supported saying it's freedom of expression. You ask my opinion, First of all, making a nude picture of any lady, whether God or not God, is haram in Islam. Whether Muslim or non-Muslim, it is unethical, inhuman. Why do you want to sell your daughters? Why are going back? See what's happening in the Western cultures. They are selling our sisters, selling our mothers, and one of the famous ads which I heard about BMW, you know BMW car? You know about the BMW car? It is somewhat like Mercedes for the youngsters. Mercedes, top level car. In that ad, I'm sorry to say, I was told that there's a lady standing in the bikini in front of that car, and it's mentioned there, test drive her now. Who, the car or the girl? <laughs> what has the girl got to do with the car? So this is all in name of freedom of expression that you're getting the woman. What FM Hussain did is totally wrong. Regarding a basic question, can you criticize they are the gods of other religion. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Anam, chapter number 6, verse number 108, revile not those, abuse not those who they worship God besides Allah, lest in their ignorance they will abuse Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Quran says, abuse not those gods who the people worship besides Allah, lest in their ignorance they will abuse Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So in Islam, it is prohibited to abuse anyone else's God, even though you may not agree is God. It's prohibited. That's what the Quran says in Surah Anam, chapter number 6, verse 108. And what F.M. Hussein did, drawing the nude painting, is totally prohibited in Islam. Hope that's the question. Pakhr Dawan, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen.
It's my extreme privilege to thank the Consul General of the U.S. Consulate of Chennai, Dr. Richard D. Haynes, Mr. Krishnachand Chorodia, Dr. M. S. Ambarasan, and Dr. Zakir Naik and his team, and all the volunteers and co-organizers of the program. Wa akhirud da'wana anil hamdulillahi rabbil alameen.